2000. <laughs> it just told me we're recording. All right, thank you, Andrea. Okay, welcome to the 2021 Virtual Annual Symposium. I am your California Central Coast Chapter President. I'm Jackie Hancock, and I'll be kicking off this event with you this morning. All right, so, oh, I have to click that I got that this is, all right. <laughs> Both of my screens. I'm working off two screens this morning because I had tech issues. All right, so let me introduce our board real quick. That's me on the left. Um, Sean Wagner is our president-elect. He will be our president next year if we have somebody come on in his place this year. He's also going to be my co-host for today. So he'll take the second half of the speakers and introduce them. Sarah Snyder is our past president. And next slide. There's Jamie Miller, our secretary. She is our Zoom wizard and handling all of the links, the slideshows and making sure our speakers have their presentations set and ready to go. She's been amazing for this. And thank you so much, Jamie, for all your help. Steph Herber is our treasurer. She is also going to be running our quiz. We have, we're gonna have little mini quiz breaks. And then at the end, we're gonna have a quick little quiz bowl and we have prizes for those. Please stay tuned and participate. And our chapter, rep, chapter representative is Andrew Dominguez. And next slide. Some of our other key parts of our members of our board, we have Andrea Dransfield who's our media manager and she is responsible for getting all of this content um, onto our website. She's been amazing. Uh, Kevin Cooper is our Conservation Affairs Committee Chair. And then we have Billy Fletcher is our Diversity Committee Chair. Uh, we haven't had a lot coming from diversity, but the Western section is building this whole, whole committee and we're looking forward to uh, some participation from the whole Western section this next year. All right, next slide. And on that, we uh, extended our board nominations to the end of this month because we are looking for some candidates to join our board. We have a secretary and treasurer are both one year terms and our chapter representative, this is, this is up this year, it's a two year term. And of course, we're looking for a president elect. This is a three year responsibility. You start with president elect, then you move on to president and then past president. And if you have any questions, you this information will be in a form that Jamie has put in the chat. I believe she's put in the chat. I'm not watching the chat at the moment, but we, uh, oh, good. Thumbs up. Yes. There's a link in the chat. If you want to check out this, if you're interested, uh, if you have a nomination, you can nominate yourself and uh, mm -hmm. If you have any questions, please reach out to us and we can alleviate any fears and that you might have about responsibilities. This is a wonderful board and everything moves real smoothly. So it's a lot of fun and I really encourage everybody to participate. Next slide. Now, if you are afraid of any kind of responsibility, you may join one of our committees. We have a number of committees that you can participate in. Some of them are in need of chapter chairs. So again, there is another form for this if you would like to be a part of a, a committee. Um, and there's more information on that form as well. And again, reach out to us if you have more questions. And next one. Oh yes, membership. So our event today is free. Thank you to our, our sponsors for that. But we really do need everybody to keep up on your membership. Renew, join today. There's a, a link right there. The link is on our website. You can get through it through Facebook. We have a lot of things planned for next year. And we are going back live, which is really, really exciting. Starting with our aquatic herp workshop, we're bringing that back next year. The Western section also has a couple of really great workshops that will be in our area. Uh, there's going to be a field training for bumblebees. There's also going to be botany for wildlifers at Fort Ord. So all of these events, if you are a member, you get a discount and it's, plus you also get up-to-date news and uh, first emails to all of this information. So please keep your membership active. Next slide. 
And here is our 50th anniversary shirt. I forgot to introduce that this is our 50th year as a chapter. So in honor of that, we put together this logo and all of the proceeds from these sales will go to support our students. And it's a great cause. So please, please check it out. And we've also opened our other campaigns too. If you missed some of those old ones or you liked some of those past shirts, they are also available. And next slide. These are our sponsors. Thank you very much to Sage Institute Incorporated, Kevin Merck Associates, Burleson Consulting Inco Incorporated, and Tara Verde. And next slide. And here are our other organizations and artists that have contributed for our prizes for our BioBlitz and trivia. And also thank you very much to High Mountain Lookout. They are the ones that supported our, our Zoom meeting to expand to more than 100 participants for this event. So we're very, very fortunate to have them help us out with that. And all of these are on the program. If you've downloaded that program, sorry, Jamie. <laughs> The links, if you click on the icons, it'll go to the links to those websites. Okay, next slide. Uh, of course, thank you to our speakers. We've collected all of their uh, associations and put them on this slide as well. We're very thankful for everybody who has come together to collaborate and share their research. And it should be a really good event today. Next slide. This is a quick look at our schedule. It's jam packed. We have three breaks and at the end we'll do our awards and a trivia quiz bowl. So please stay tuned. And at the very end this evening, we are all meeting at local breweries throughout our chapter region. And each place will have a board representative there. So please join us. We will also have a pitcher of beer to share. <laughs> And next slide. Is that our That's last it. slide? That's, That's our last it. slide. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. I was worried I was gonna go over time. Okay. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So again, uh, quick questions. Uh, if you have questions for your presenters, raise your hand or type it out in the chat. We will be monitoring that chat as we go through and we'll have brief session for question and answer at the end if we run out of time and we'll just compile those questions and put them together and send them out to everybody so they're available and can look at answers. And I saw Robert Cooper's name pop up, but I'll give him a, his extra minute. <laughs> Robert Cooper is on. He's been made a co-host and I know that Andrea is recording right now. I'm going to go ahead and start recording as a backup. Great. Thank you, Jamie. All right. Well, let me go ahead and introduce Robert Cooper. He is a postdoc at UCLA working on various projects involving the California tiger salamander system. Broadly, Robert is interested in applying modern quantitative techniques to understand and solve pressing conservation issues. Robert presented for us earlier this spring during our first virtual lecture of the year, and we're delighted to have him back and kick off our virtual symposium. So thank you, Robert, for coming back. We're very excited. Of course. To thank be you, here. Jackie. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that warm introduction, um, and thanks everyone for putting on this event. I'm really happy to be kicking off the day. It looks like a really exciting list of speakers. Can everyone hear and see screen all right? Thumbs up. Excellent. OK, so today I'm going to be talking about the effect that pond hydro period has on California tiger salamanders. And this is a lot of the work that I did throughout my dissertation, which I recently finished up. Yay! And I speak a little bit about this earlier in the year. Um, but I'll be talking about sort of the next chapter moving on from those previous results. So hopefully there's plenty of new stuff to keep you interested. Okay, so first a brief outline. I'm going to introduce the California tiger salamander system for those that aren't familiar. I'm going to talk a little bit about the previous pond experiment results that I'd already shared. So I'll just go highlight the, um, the important bits from that. 
And then mostly I'll be talking about this new demographic model that we're using to sort of ask important questions about management of the species. And then finally, I'll talk about some conclusions and recommendations. So California tiger salamanders are an, in, it's an endangered salamander. They are endemic to California. They have a pretty limited distribution. Um, there's a population up north, the central population, and then down in Santa Barbara. And for the purpose of this talk, I'll be talking mostly about the Monterey population, because that's where most of this work took place. And they have a biphasic life cycle, which means that they have both aquatic and terrestrial phases. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So they start off as an aquatic embryo, so an egg laid in the earth. Unlike most ambistomatic salamanders, they lay single eggs, um, but they can sometimes cluster like you see in this image. Then after about two to four weeks, um, the eggs hatch and you have a free swimming larvae. And then about three to four months later, and this is the real critical period, they wander up onto land as a metamorph where they'll spend the rest of their eight to 12 year life as um, terrestrial adults. And what's clear is that these vernal pools, these ponds in which the salamanders breed are really important throughout their entire life history. And by vernal pool, we mean an ephemeral wetland. So one that fills in the winter with precipitation and tends to dry in the summer. And the hydro period is the length of time that that water body holds water. And this can exert really strong selective force in CTS. You imagine that if the larvae in those ponds are unable to complete their development and wander up on the land before the pond dries, then everyone in that pond dies. So it's really important. And tiger salamanders are threatened by many different uh, facts in their life uh, by habitat destruction, fragmentation. But what I'll be talking about is this really complicated issue of native hybridization. So back in the 50s and 60s, these fishing bait dealers brought in a bunch of these non-native barred tiger salamanders and released them in the Salinas Valley to be sold as fishing bait. Then these individuals kind of wandered out. Of course, they didn't stay put and they hybridized with all of the native CTS in the area. And what, is it, what I'll be talking about a lot in this is the hybrid index score. So this does the percent non-native. And so if you have a complete non-native barred tiger salamander, they have 100% HIS. 0% means they're completely native. Okay, so here's a map, as best we understand, of the distribution of hybrids. And so all of those bright colors in the center in the Salinas Valley, those are all ponds that have hybrids in them. But there's also populations up in the north in Sonoma, and down in Santa Barbara as well. So this is sort of a large scale pervasive issue. And if we zoom into the Salinas Valley, um, you might recognize, you know, that's the Salinas Valley in there. And there's a lot of native ponds that hybrids can still migrate to and invade. And so this is a pressing issue. So previous studies have looked at, you know, what factors support these hybrids? Why are hybrids doing so well in the environment? And a mesocosm study by Jarrett Johnson specifically looked at this, um, so using pond tanks filled with water. And he found that, um, that the native tiger salamanders tended to do better in those short hydro periods, and the non-natives tend to do better in those long duration hydro periods. And so we sought to really investigate this, to do it in a natural setting with, with real large ponds um, and see if that holds true. So we developed some ponds. Uh, this is a schematic of how we constructed ponds. We use PVC liners because we're in sandy soils um, and we had very specific uh, depths and length requirements. So this is us digging the ponds. We stretched the liners out. We used heavy equipment to sort of excavate those basins. Um, and we were able to construct 18 of these ponds um, in the Southern part of Fort Ord. And that gave us an experimental array to really test the effects of hydrocarbon. And then what we did is we went out and sank a lot of these ponds. We sank natural ponds and the bunnies love blue little larvae in the corner and added them. So we collected all the metamorphs as they successfully completed um, and survived in the ponds. And this is just to show you some of the amazing diversity that, that we saw. Um, so we have some really dark, small individuals. We had some really colored, almost greenish individuals. These nice, brightly spotted metamorphs. 
and ones that were almost completely yellow. So we had a huge amount of diversity and it was really fun to get to see these. So one of the main results that we found is that um, looking at the average mass, and we know that mass is really important as they come out of these ponds. And so the hybrids had a really strong effect with hydroperiods. So the longer the ponds held water, the much heavier and more massive those hybrid individuals were. The native CTS exhibited a very similar pattern, but it was much weaker. So they benefited less from each additional day of, of pond duration. And this results to about a four times increase for the hybrids. And so for every given day, those hybrids are benefiting four times as much in their mass at metamorphosis, which is really significant. So next we can also see that how non-native, so the, the high index score also dictates some of that mass. So the more non-native the salamanders are, the larger they tend to be. And again, we know this mass is really important because uh, based on previous studies, it's been shown to be the key determinant of the number of years it takes for an adult to reach maturity, their survival and their lifetime reproduction. And so it's a really key feature. And then the other main takeaway of this experiment was the um, percent surviving or proportion surviving. And so hybrids, you can see that red line there, the hybrid survival was always above the native CTS survival. Um, and we can also look at the difference between those two curves. So if we subtract, the red line, sorry, we subtract the blue line from the red line. So this is to say, how much better did the hybrids do as we increase hydro period? And we see that it's always positive. So they always did better, but even more um, interesting is that it's increasing as it goes. So not only do they constantly benefit more, but that benefit increases the longer those hold water. So conclusions from this part of the study, this was what we hoped to find, expected to find, but unfortunately what we found is there was no real point on that curve where the hybrids did, uh, sorry, the natives did better. The hybrids were always above. And so there's no hydro period that stands out as being the ideal for selecting natives in the face of this hybrid swarm. So next we wanted to investigate. So what happens at these short hydro periods? Is it still enough to slow the spread of non-native salamanders? So to do that, we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about demography. And so this is sort of your classic demographic model. It's state structured. So you have larvae that have some rate of survival. They become adults and those adults survive each year. And some years those adults um, will give, uh, they will lay eggs and that counts as fecundity or P there. And so it's a pretty simple model. But unfortunately, this model assumes that all individuals, all adults function the same. Everybody has equal probability of laying eggs, equal probability of survival. And we know that's really not true in the wild. Because you know, just taking the metamorphs from, from our previous experiment, there's huge individuals, there's small individuals, and we know that that drastically changes their, um, their vital rates. So we take our model. And we introduce this new integral projection model. And I won't talk too much about this, but it's kind of important to know the difference here. So it's very much like that same structured model, but it includes continuous traits. And so we can include something like an individual's mass and use that relationship to get a more accurate prediction of their survival and of their reproduction. And so just showing this graphically, what we can do is say that within adults, we know that the more massive an individual is, the more fecund they'll be. And this is some really fantastic work. Um, and I would love to take credit for it, but this is all Chris Searcy, Ariana Masterman. Uh, they put together this integral projection model and it's really fantastic. Um, but then with this model, you don't actually include information about individuals. And so it sort of takes the population. So you see this curve here, it sort of you know, says that there's this distribution and then next year that distribution will shift. And so you don't have any information about any given individual in that population. So we modified it to function at the level of the individual. So we can include things like size, their age, um, how much they breed, what their fecundity is and when they die. And we can track all of that through these simulations. So then we use data from our hydro period experiment to inform these, these different uh, parameters in the model. And just again, showing that, so we take our, our different relationships and we put them together and that gives us the survival and that gives us the mass of any given individual. 
Okay, so that's the, the bare bones of the, of the demographic model. And then we applied this model to different like management scenarios or different demographic scenarios. And to do this, there's many ways to do it, but we said all hybrids start at 75% non-native. And then we read the proportion of that population that are hybrids. So one would be all individuals are hybrids. It's complete hybrid population. Zero would be everyone is completely native and then all of the different uh, fractions in between. Then the other factor was hydro period. So we had, that's pretty self-explanatory, we had a range of different hydro periods. And this says that the population um, is all centered around a single pond and that pond every year has a hydro period of 80 days or 100 days or, or whatever. And it's important to note that each population has both of these features. And so when we show the figures, you know, keep in mind that both of these things are sort of changing at the same time. And so we'll depict that in the figures. <clears throat> so the first thing we can get the model to do is give us the density independent growth. This is the exponential, you know, unlimited population growth. And so this is says, you know, how can CTS grow under ideal conditions with unlimited resources? And as we expect, you know, they sort of row geometrically. And from this, we can calculate lambda. And lambda is the intrinsic population growth. And so you can think of it as how many replacements each adult makes. So if you have a lambda of one, every adult replaces themselves and the population stays exactly constant. Higher than one means the population grows, lower than one means it crashes. So these are the results and give me a minute just to walk through these. And so if you look at the figure on the top, here we have hydro period on the x-axis. And so as hydro period increases, all the different lines go up. So we know that hydro period is really increasing that population growth rate. Um, and then the different colors are those different proportion um, populations. And so the white one on the bottom is all native individuals, whereas the red one on top is all hybrids. And so it shows you how this, this relationship changes with those different levels. And the same thing, but reverse for the figure on the bottom. And so what we see is that lambda increases with longer hydro period. And hydro period has about a 1.13 times greater effect than the proportion of hybrids, which isn't huge, but it means that this is mostly governed by the length of time the pond holds water. <clears throat> and this is huge because if you have a population with a lambda of one versus a lambda of 1.75, that really changes how quickly those populations can respond to catastrophic events or something that reduces its size. And another takeaway here is that if we look at this top figure, um, hydro periods less than 90 days is pretty much unsustainable. Uh, most of those are below one, which means the population can't sustain itself even without density dependence. And this is especially true in the all native populations. And we also see that around 110 days, it's sort of a diminishing return. Those curves sort of fan out a little bit, which means that we don't really expect them to benefit all that much more from greater than 110 day durations. Uh, okay, so next, that's all fine and good, but rarely exists in the wild. And so next we look at density dependence. So when the population is limited by, you know, limited resources, you know, breeding habitat, et cetera. And so as we can see in, the, in this example, the population increases and then it sort of levels out. And where it levels out, um, as you probably recall, that's the carrying capacity. And so we, took, we estimated the carrying capacity from years 50 to 100, and we just sort of drew an average of that flat portion of the curve. And that gave us what the um, carrying capacity was. And again, we see a really similar pattern where <clears throat> hydro period is really driving this trend. So as you increase hydro period, the carrying capacity increases exponentially. And comparing the hydro period and proportion hybrids, hydro period has a roughly almost 10 times greater effect than the proportion of hybrids in there. For every one day we increase the hydro period, it has an estimated 14% increase in carrying capacity. So it's really important. You can imagine that has huge implications for how many individuals a population can support. And we do see a significant trend in the proportion of hybrids as well, just much less one. 
Okay, so next we can actually add some environmental stochasticity, which means just unpredictability in the rain, which we all, many of us live in California and we all know that's a real thing. And so this, this um, stochasticity means that there'll be less rainfall some years, which means there'll be less breeding females and lower larval survival, things that were all so prized in nature. And so what you see with the, um, the bar charts is that the red, those red um, distributions are the simulations that went extinct and the green are the ones that survived. So as we increase hydro period, we have a much greater chance of survival for each of those populations. And again, this pattern is largely driven by hydro period. You can see that in the low hydro period, 80 days, almost every simulation went extinct. Whereas as soon as we get up higher, um, all of them survived. And if we zoom in, at a, at a hydro period of around 90 days, we predict about 30% of those populations to go extinct. But when we go up to 95 days, so just five days more, we predict only 2% of those populations to go extinct. So that actually might be a great threshold um, that could inform future management decisions. Okay, so some conclusions from this work. <clears throat> well, we can successfully model these management scenarios. And while we didn't get the awesome result we wanted, uh, this, this is a very useful tool because now we can apply this to any future management scenarios that we want to figure out whether they are predicted to work or not. And we can use individual traits, such as an individual size or uh, genetic components in order to inform that model. We also see that high period has the greatest effect on CTS demography. It increases the intrinsic growth rate, carrying capacity, and the population viability. However, the proportion of it's also contribute just to a much lesser degree. Finally, a hydro period of less than 90 days leads to extinct. And this is actually what most people had predicted in the field. Um, it hadn't been quantified like this, but you tend to see that ponds that don't last as long as 90 days don't really support viable populations. So it's nice to see all of the, you know, the simulations and mathematics works out the same as what we have in nature. Unfortunately, this isn't the silver bullet that's going to prevent hybrids from existing in the wild, unfortunately. But managing hydro period can still significantly limit the hybrid success. So even reducing it by five or 10 days will seriously limit the huge expansion those hybrids are seeing. Um, and another important thing is that hybrid is still really important for native CTS. And so parts of the population that aren't impacted by hybrids, if we increase that hydro period, then we'll really benefit those populations. We'll increase their numbers, we'll increase their growth. Um, so that's an important management outcome. So some recommendations. Well, like we're saying, if we increase hydro period of native ponds, that might really help those native populations. And I don't suggest modifying natural, beautiful vernal pools, but sadly we don't have many of those left. So, what this could involve is constructing new ponds or modifying artificial ponds uh, to have good hydrology in most years. And here I just show you some is we've been doing this a lot in other projects where we have a mathematical model we can use to tell us how deep and what how a pond should look in order to achieve a certain hydro period. So we have the ability to do this. We just need um, the funding and the resources. Also, we might want to shorten hydro periods in the middle of hybrid zones, so ponds that are just completely hybrid. It'll reduce their population size. It'll limit the, the number of uh, dispersers that it's sending out in every direction um, while still allowing those ponds to function like vernal pools. So this is a much better technique than draining them completely for 10 years, which would impact all the other pond breeding uh, organisms in the area. This also might buy us time for other management techniques. And so really the heart of it is removing those large hybrid individuals from the population. And so finally, to give a little hope at the end of this, what we need to do is be able to specifically target hybrids and remove them. And so what we've previously done, so the, the work I did in genetics for all of this uh, takes about three to four months. You sequence over 5,000 genes, but that takes a long time. And you, and you need at least 500 individuals to sequence that. Otherwise it's not cost effective. So that takes way too long. Works for a PhD, but not for management decisions. So we need a way to rapidly identify genomics in the field. 
So the first, this, this method called Fluidime takes about two to three days and you get 96 SNPs, so almost a hundred SNPs for almost a hundred individuals. And that gives you pretty good resolution to make these decisions. And that's way, way faster. So we've been using this at a project in Sonoma. So if you can hold individuals for three days, you can get these results and make decisions then. And an even more exciting thing that we've just barely scratched the surface of is something called Sherlock, uh, which is an acronym. I can't remember what it stands for. Uh, but what this uses is this for CAS, it's like really breaking technology to in the field, one tube in one hour, be able to tell whether or not an individual is native or non-native. So that can have some serious implications for how we move forward. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge so many people that made all these projects possible from Thor and Sean and Shaley and everyone at Burleson um, to all the folks at BLM, the UCs um, and everyone. It was really a great experience and I couldn't have done it without you. So thank you very much. And I'd love to open it up for some questions. Thank you, Robert. That was amazing. Very, very short, but very sweet. Do we have any questions? I don't see anything in the chat yet. I have a quick question. So uh, you kind of glossed over pretty quickly about uh, what to do in a zone where it's fully hybrid. Uh, I work at Fort Hunter Liggett and that is our zone is fully hybrid. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've always, uh, we've grappled with this, this dilemma of how do you remove non-natives, tiger salamanders that spend most of their life in the, out in the field that is quite extensive. Um, and then we do have a number of smaller natural vernal pools that would that would support uh, where they do behave like a, a native. So I was wondering if there was any idea of how to tackle, how to handle a hybrid population. Yeah, and that's a great question. Fort Hunter Lincoln, of course, is a, a very unique circumstance. You know, it's, it's just from a lot of the population. Um, it's, it's a little questionable if there were even native tiger salamanders there um, previously, or if someone had just brought these non-natives in, because if you look at the genetics of that area, they're almost 100% non-native. It's as though it's like a pot gun of just barred tiger salamanders. But I think for, for areas like that, like you said, it's, it's almost impossible to go out and like find all these adults in the wild. So that's why doing things like managing those ponds um, you know, might be the best solution because a lot of times those non-natives do really well in ponds that hold water all year round, year after year, you know, these really big ponds. Um, and I think that's going to have the biggest effect. So if we can get those ponds to function normally, even just having them dry up each year, you know, we, we talk about this fine line of hydro period, but really if you can reduce it to below 200 days a year, I think you're going to have a huge effect because you remove a lot of those pedomorphic individuals that just stay in there year round. Uh, another, I mean, everything else is, is pretty intensive. So we can put minnow traps out in those ponds and collect the adults. So that's a great way. It's the easiest way to find the adults. Um, so as they come on, they just swim around in circles. They get in those minnow traps. You check them every day. And so if we had the ability to, to identify what's a hybrid and what's native, then you could remove those hybrid individuals as you catch them. So that's probably the most realistic way. But in a place like Fort Hunter Liggett, I'm, I really don't know how much you could do. You might just be removing a lot of salamanders, uh, but it would definitely be useful in many of those situations. Great, thank you. I did see one mm -hmm. question come in the chat, so let's ask this real quick. Are there broader negative impacts caused when the hybrids overtake a native California tiger set? salamander uh, in a given ecosystem? There are, yeah. And I, I debated removing that slide. Um, so I tried <laughs> to shorten it up, but that's a great question. And it's a really important one. So uh, other experiments also by Chris Searcy showed where he set up mesocosms and he put exact numbers of different vernal pool creatures in there from like tadpoles to invertebrates. And then he had ponds with natives and ponds with hybrids. And he found that the hybrids tend to eat more, they gobble up, and they really reduce the, uh, the biodiversity and the assembly of those different communities. And so we do have a quantifiable effect. The hybrids reduce the, the, um, 
diversity of those vernal pool systems. They tend to eat everything that they can and that releases all of the sort of bottom level prey. Um, and also, you know, they, they have a much larger gape so they can fit more things in their mouth and it puts thing, other endangered species like long-toed salamanders, red-legged frogs, it puts those animals on the menu, um, which generally natives can't eat them. So they do have substantial effects. Okay. Well, we've run out of time for questions. There is another question in the chat. Robert, if you have a moment to enter the chat and then ask, answer that question, that would be fabulous. It's a good question about um, protecting hybrids under the Endangered Species Act. Um, we do need to move on to our next presenter, uh, who is Chris Karras. Sure. Chris has a BS in zoology from Southern Illinois University and is a wildlife biologist for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the Salinas River and El Ellicott Slough National Wildlife Refuges. Much of his career has been involved with invasive species management and habitat restoration on fed federal lands. He is an associate wildlife biologist and a longtime member of the Wildlife Society. So welcome, Chris. Good morning. Um... Does everything look good? Looks good here. All right, so yeah, I'm Chris Karras. I'm, for some reason, I'm super nervous. I don't know why, but uh, I, I think I'd be more nervous if we were in person. Um, I'm the wildlife biologist for the Salinas River National Wildlife Refuge and the Ellicott Slough National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about Smith's Blue Butterfly, which is endangered uh, blue butterfly on um, the Salinas Refuge. Let's see. Uh, pictured here, um, we <clears throat> is a male and a female. So obviously it gets its name because it's blue, the males and the females are kind of brown. So dichromatic. A little bit about the biology um, of the butterfly. <laughs> Euphilodes and Optis smithy is the, um, the name of the Smith's blue butterfly. It's a subspecies. Uh, they're univoltine, so they have one brood produced per year per flight season, uh, which is at the refuge June through August. Uh, adults are dichromatic and they live about a week. Uh, and in that week, they, they mate and they oviposit eggs. Um, <clears throat> the food plants are critical. They um, do every aspect of their life on aragonum uh, par parvifolium and latifolium. So uh, primarily at the refuge, uh, it's parvifolium. Going south through Big Sur, I think a lot of folium is more dominant. <clears throat> Dispersal in home range, they don't disperse very well. They're you know, very small and prone to getting blown around by wind. Um, they do have um, predators, are, include birds, other uh, invertebrates, spiders, stuff like that, lizards. So uh, I just want to mention that some of these slides I stole from Dick Arnold's. Many of you probably know who Dick Arnold is. He really um, has been uh, kind of a driving force in getting me schooled up on Smith's Blue Butterflies. He has been doing butterflies and other inverts for as a, a consultant for over 50 years. And um, I just wanted to mention that some of these slides came from him. So. Habitat associations. At the refuge, I have four dunes and back dunes, rear dunes, um, coastal scrub, coastal bluffs, grasslands, cliff chaparral, and rocky outcrops. This uh, map here was taken from uh, something here. from a special status assessment, which is kind of like a five-year review uh, that was done in 2020. And it shows Smith's blue detections throughout the known range um, and divides the two into, uh, divides them into two meta populations. The Northern one in blue is on Monterey Bay and the Southern one is along the Big Sur coast and um, going up to um, almost to Monterey. This is a slide from Dick Arnold's, one of Dick Arnold's presentations. Um, in green, you can see um, detections or occurrences observed uh, prior to 1977. 
So I was, I'm 50 years old. I was six, six years old when Dick Arnold was uh, uh, detecting Smith's blue butterflies and, on Big Sur. Um, and then observ observations from 1977 to 2014. Um, and you can see they go range up into Carmel Valley and all the way down almost to Ragged Point in San Luis Obispo County. So the refuge uh, is about 367 acres in total. It's located just southwest of Castroville and north of Marina in Monterey County and shown here in a little blob in green. It's pretty small, small but mighty. The refuge has a parking lot and some hiking trails, supports surf fishing, duck hunting, as well as hiking and bird watching. And it's, uh, it's about three quarters of a mile walked from the parking lot to the beach. So the refuge offers some really quiet beaches where people, um, you know, you can go there and almost have a have them to yourself certain times of the of the of the day. <clears throat> Shown here is a kind of a close up of the Smith's Blue habitat at the refuge, which is totals about 14 acres. Um, it's the back dune area we call it. Um, it's characterized by more established vegetation, perennial vegetation, a lot of mock heather. Um, has a steeper profile, and uh, the four dunes obviously are closer to the water. They have are much more dynamic, they have much less vegetation, and they're not as high. So this slide here um, kind of shows, and this is taken from Butterflies of North America, it's a, also a Dick Arnold slide, um, kind of shows some of the differences between some of the butterflies the, that occur or co-occur in the same range as Smith's blue. Akmon blue is uh, co-occurs throughout the range. And Tilden's is sort of uh, more inland and associated not with parvifolium and latifolium, but with nudum, which is uh, naked stem buckwheat. Um, there are a lot of nuances here and Dick Arnold really does a good job in his presentations on how to tell the difference between Smith's blue and Akmon's and Tilden's, but um, I won't go into that much detail here. Um, <clears throat> Here's a life cycle slide. Uh, this is, uh, some of this is El Segundo blue, but it's essentially the same. Adults fly for about a week. They live uh, where they uh, mate, oviposit eggs. The eggs hatch after a week or so, um, become caterpillars, which have five instars. They feed on buckwheat exclusively. The eggs are laid on buckwheat exclusively. And the pupa um, over winter in the duff, below the buckwheat. So uh, it can't be overestimated how important the buckwheat plants are to this species. And you can see the ant tending a caterpillar there. It's kind of cool. So at the refuge, um, prior to 2015, uh, we realized that the refuge would be a good place to do some monitoring for Smith's blue. At the time, we there was nobody doing any uh, regular monitoring of the population. So Dick Arnold was contracted to train us up, uh, the staff, on the basic biology, survey techniques, assistant protocol development, and population monitoring program was, was implemented in 2015. Some of the challenges with surveying for uh, Smith's blue are temperature and wind. So if it's too windy, they they don't fly, they're hard to detect because they're extremely cryptic and small. Uh, if it's cold, they're also, you know, they're poikilothermic, so they're, they're slow moving in the cold and active in the warm. Uh, and this chart just uh, shows that at this table. <clears throat> so using uh, the Arnold and Holmes paper uh, from 2015, they developed a, um, method of population estimation, which involved um, mark recapture, recapture study data um, taken for a, a, a species and then can be applied to some incredible mathematics that are way beyond my capacity. Uh, but the idea being that a discrete uh, generation uh, as shown in this um, kind of uh, distribution curve here, natural um, distribution curve, <clears throat> where at the refuge, June, roughly June 10th would be the first day, July 10th would be the middle 
and August 10th would be the end. And if all things being equal and detection was, was equal for, for everything else, the population would actually be very small in the beginning of the flight season, very big in the middle of the flight season or the optimal time, and then once again, tapering off. So always individuals, you know, on, on either side of the curve, but that, that July 4th weekend is always the, the best for looking for butterflies at the refuge. So unfortunately, this is the bad news. Uh, first year we had 1,483 um, butterflies for the refuge in our, in our estimate. 739 following, 605, 720, 395. And then 2020 and 2021, I'd like to say we didn't do surveys because of COVID, but we did do surveys. And unfortunately, the detections were so low, we were unable to run the analysis, which involves R and all that, and all that kind of stuff. So you need to have a population big enough to, and, and detections, enough detections to be able to do the analysis as, as we uh, were prescribed by the protocol. So definitely a, a, a trend, downward trend. So what's the problem? And um, I want to point out the Smith's Blue Butterfly and the Dune Aster over here, which is a really cool picture because they so rarely are, are seen on anything but a buckwheat by me. Um, environmental stress is a possibility. Um, drought, obviously we've had you know, more years of drought in the last 10 years than not drought, but um, could be contaminants, could be predators or something that we don't know about. Um, surveyor effects, I've been using the same transects for um, the whole time. You know, they're 20 foot wide transects and I do them two to three times a week throughout the flight season. Um, I hope that I'm not creating an impact, but it's a possibility. So we're considering changing the transects moving forward. Um, it's also possible this is a natural fluctuation. You know, a lot of uh, inverts are boom and bust population, um, you know, depending on, on all sorts of different things. And it's kind of a, a natural thing. Um, one, problem or one situation that I didn't, that I regret is Dick Arnold explained early on to count the buckwheat blooms. Um, and he had, he had published papers that showed buckwheat blooms um, are an exact correlation to population, at least with El Segundo blue. And he said that he could count bl the blooms in a site and give you a population estimate, which was pretty decent for the butterflies on that site. Um, I started counting blooms. I lost interest because who wants to count blooms when you can count butterflies, right? And uh, I now regret it because with this kind of decline in the population at the refuge, um, I can't say for certain, but it seems as though my buckwheat has been uh, reduced. So. Uh, if I had taken the time to count those blooms in the beginning, I would at least have a little more of an idea what was going on. And finally, uh, we're looking for people to um, help us out. Um, Deb Kirkland is the Ventura Ecological Service uh, Office uh, biologist who is the species lead for Smith's Blue. Um, and there's, we'd just like to remind everybody there's no permit requirement to go out and look for butterflies and to take photographs of butterflies. So if you think you have Smith's Blue on your, on your land you manage um, or in a place where you happen to go, um, let us know. And we would like to send somebody out or, or train people up um, to get a better idea of the range of this, of this uh, endangered species. <clears throat> and I think that's it. Final picture is uh, Diane Kodama took this. It's uh, everybody likes the pictures of the males because they're blue and they're like lightning and metallic and awesome. And I would say that this picture does uh, the females uh, a lot of justice here. So any questions, I'd be happy to, to try to answer. Thank you, Chris, that was fantastic. Um, we have time to squeeze one question in. I'd like to try to stay on schedule as much as possible. Uh, we have one from David Kisner. Uh, is climate change changing the blooming period for buckwheat? I'm not sure. Um, probably, 
but it's hard to say. Yeah. We live, the refuge is at the northern end of the range, the known range. Um, and I always think of climate change as moving species northward as, you know, as things get hotter and warmer. Um, but I've always um, said that the, the refuge was an important place because it would detect, um, you know, a contraction in the range uh, mm -hmm. from the north. So, um, yeah, uh, climate change, big, lots of questions, lots of, more, more questions than answers, I'm sorry to say. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. If anybody else has any questions, please put it in the chat. And Chris, if you can hang on for a little bit and see if there's any questions you can answer, that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. we have one, one more talk before we, we break for, a, for five minutes. And uh, this one is coming from Thomas P. Franzem. Thomas is a PhD candidate at the University of Alabama. His research is focused on insect ecology, grassland ecology, sampling methods, and biogeography. In addition to his academic research, he is also the president of the University of Alabama's Conservation Biology Society. Unfortunately, uh, because he's in Alabama, he could not make our talk today because of the time difference. Um, so please, if you have any questions after viewing his presentation, put them in the chat and we will gather them and share them with Thomas and hopefully get those answers back to you. All right, thank you. So I will be doing the screen share for Thomas's talk. If you guys cannot hear him, please let me know and I'll reshare it. <laughs> and this talk is about 15 minutes. Hello and thank you all for coming to my talk. We're currently facing a biodiversity crisis where we're seeing uh, declines in multiple animal groups. Uh, in particular, uh, insects are declining pretty significantly. The figure on the top right there is showing uh, flying insect biomass over the past 30 years. And as you can see, it is a downward trend. Uh, similarly, we're seeing declines uh, in insect diversity uh, in multiple different habitat types. So the lower figure there is showing um, insect diversity. Uh, in grasslands and forests. And again, we're seeing a declining trend in diversity. Uh, this is important because insects are ecologically influential. You know, they're vital links in food webs. They're involved in pollination, nutrient cycling. So these declines uh, threaten to disrupt a lot of ecosystem processes. So to pre uh, preserve biodiversity and ecosystem services that biodiversity imparts to us, it's important that conservationists and ecologists identify when and where populations and distributional changes are occurring, as well as the drivers of those changes. Uh, to do that, we need more data. And for insects, uh, they're pretty underrepresented in biodiversity data sets. This figure here is showing taxonomic bias and biodiversity occurrence data. The x-axis is scaled, so that if the taxa is at zero, it is ideally represented in biodiversity data sets. And as you can see, uh, insects have quite a uh, occurrence shortfall. Um, you know, this is largely due to the fact that insects can be kind of time consuming to survey and require uh, some expertise to identify. Switching gears a little bit, uh, an increasingly common way uh, to gather biodiversity data is by conducting what's called a bio blitz. Essentially, this crowdsources the collection of biodiversity data uh, over a couple of days. Generally, volunteers uh, will explore a property and generate a list of the species that they encounter. So in, in you know, in this one to two day bio blitz, uh, volunteers will haphazardly collect data on plants and animals that they come across. And often the participants are members of the general public. So this is a really common outreach tool, outreach tool and a community science project. So the loose structure of bio blitzes, however, can cause taxonomic bias, all right? So volunteers might focus on easily visible and identifiable taxa. That short time frame also uh, can cause temporal bias. So migratory animals or organisms with short activity windows can be missed by observers. Bio blitzes with professionals might help reduce that taxonomic bias, but that temporal bias is typically still present. Uh, you know, expert bio blitzes generally are in a short time frame as well. Further, the species list generated from both the traditional and expert bio blitz uh, can be of limited limited utility. Um, you know, it is generally just a list, uh, and while that can be useful, it does not lend itself to statistical analysis. So to address the shortfalls of the, of the traditional BioBlitz framework, uh, we developed an extension of the BioBlitz that we term recurring expert BioBlitz. It's recurring because it's multiple short surveys taking place across the year. It's expert because it's, it's utilizing either trained volunteers or uh, taxonomic experts that are 
uh, following standardized methods and specifically targeting a particular text on a group. And it's a bio blitz because we're maintaining that mentality of efficiency and expensiveness and intense surveys aimed at generating a species list. Uh, so this REB design is essentially to sample uh, the same sites on a property multiple times to separate the observation process from the ecological process. Uh, this is very similar to the temporally and spatially replicated design common in Bayesian uh, ecological modeling. And again, the goal here is to generate a detailed species list, uh, but while structuring the data in a way that enables robust statistical analysis. So the goals of this, of the specific goals of this project were to generate a list of insects using the REB design, and then compare the REB insect list to a traditional bioblitz insect list from the same property, and then finally analyze the REB data with a hierarchical occupancy model. Our study site was Alabama Forever Wilds Big Canoe Creek. Uh, I refer to it as BCC from here on out. Uh, in August 2018, Al Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources conducted a bio blitz there. Um, there were about 10 to 30 participants uh, haphazardly collecting data across two days. Uh, I was among those participants and uh, I was haphazardly collecting data on the insects I encountered. The following year, in 2019, we conducted an REB at the same property. Uh, we had four two-day surveys. Uh, one was in January, one was in April, one was in August, and one was in October. During all of these surveys, uh, we, uh, we recorded data on insects and birds. Uh, I'm here only reporting on insects because that was my contribution to the project. Uh, we do, however, have a paper that has been submitted for publication uh, that details both the insect and bird side of things. So uh, stay tuned. Fingers crossed it'll be coming out soon. Uh, anyway, though, uh, during each of these surveys, uh, we sampled the same sites. Uh, specifically, I collected insects in uh, seven 50 by 50 meter sampling plots. Within each of those plots, I generated four parallel 20 meter transects. And I collected insects along those transects using a sweep net. And then uh, two of the four transects per plot were selected for aspirator sampling. And, a and aspirator is basically a uh, mouth operated insect vacuum. So, uh, as far as analysis, we calculated the observed insect family richness from both the traditional bioblitz and the REB. Uh, family was the lowest taxon of resolution that we could confidently assign all insect <clears throat> observations. And I should also note that from the traditional bioblitz, we used the full data set, so the insect observations from all the participants, not just my observations. Uh, we visualized insect order composition for both the traditional bioblitz and REB. And then for taxa with enough, enough observations in the REB, we fit single season fixed effects site occupancy models. Essentially, these are paired Bernoulli functions, one to estimate probability of a species occupying a site, and one to estimate the probability of detecting that species during a given survey, uh, assuming that it occupies that site. Uh, we included non-correlated occupancy and detection covariates. Um, our occupancy covariates were understory and midstory plant yield diversity and density, as well as, as well as pine basal area, harbor basal area, and total basal area. And our detection covariates were time of day, temperature, and net sweeps per plot. As far as model selection for our hierarchical occupancy models, we use stochastic search variable selection. Essentially, this decomposes the standard regression coefficient into a product of an indicator variable, here termed delta, and the regression coefficient. So delta is bound between zero and one, and the posterior estimate of delta is close to zero. It basically removes the covariate from the model, and when the posterior of delta is close to one, it includes it. Uh, our prior distribution for the regression coefficient was a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation set by a corresponding delta value, and our priors for occupancy detection intercepts were vague logistic distributions. And finally, we estimated parameters in the Bayesian framework using MCMC algorithms, and we monitored the R-hat statistic for chain convergence. All right, so uh, some results. So as far as family richness in the traditional bioblitz, uh, 63 insect families were detected. Uh, and in the REB, 107 were detected. So certainly we detected uh, more insect families in the REB than in the traditional bioblitz. Uh, this figure here is showing the proportion of observations for the five most observed insect orders in both the traditional bioblitz and the REB. Uh, the pink bars are the traditional bioblitz and the REB is the blue bars. So as you can see, uh, Lepidoptera and Hymenoptera uh, you know, dominated uh, the traditional bioblitz data set. Uh, Lepidoptera accounts for nearly half of all the observations and combined Hymenoptera and Lepidoptera account for over 80% of the observations. Uh, so certainly we're seeing Hymenoptera and Lepidoptera are overrepresented in the traditional bioblitz data set. Um, and, you know, going from 
you know, those two highly observed orders to the next most observed order, it's quite a fall off, right? Going from Hymenoptera to, to Coleoptera, going from 34% to 6%. So definitely we're seeing those two orders are overrepresented and then other orders are underrepresented. As far as the REB, no one order really dominates the data set. Columbula certainly makes up a lot of observations. That's largely due to the hyperabundance of Columbula, especially in the January sampling occasion. Uh, again, though, we're not really seeing one order dominating the data set. Uh, and, you know, we're not seeing a steep drop off like we did for the, tr for the traditional bioblitz, right? We're seeing kind of a gentle slope as we go from the most observed to the less observed in the REB data set. As far as occupancy models, we were able to fit models for 15 taxa. Uh, here we're only presenting results for Prenolopsis in Paris. That's a type of ant uh, because it's the most compelling model outputs and I think it highlights the utility of the REB. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit later. So we detected P in Paris in January, April, and October of the REB. Uh, here's our posterior probability distribution for occupancy of P in Paris in January. So the red lines are mean occupancy and the blue lines are the 95% in Beijing credible interval. So generally we're seeing pretty wide BCIs that indicate some uncertainty in our estimates. Uh, we are seeing, however, that sites two, six, and seven have pretty high uh, estimates of mean occupancy. Here's our uh, occupancy distribution for April. Uh, again, fairly wide BCIs for all these estimates. Uh, we're seeing that site four is a pretty high estimate of mean occupancy. Uh, but the other ones are rather inconclusive. And finally, here's our October distributions. Uh, again, fairly wide BCIs. Sites 2, 4, 6, and 7 uh, have high estimates of mean occupancy, and relative to the other sites, they have very narrow BCIs. As far as model selection, uh, SSVS only indicated pine basal area was an important covariate in all the models. Uh, so pine basal area exerted the most influence in October. See on figure A there. Uh, Pine basal area uh, in, in October has a delta of 0.73, so that's, that's pretty high, and it has the highest mean coefficient value uh, in October as well. We're generally seeing a positive association between pine basal area and occupancy probability. That relationship is most pronounced in October. If you look at figure D, you see that as pine basal area increases, mean occupancy increases as well, uh, and those BCIs narrow. Uh, further sites with highest mean occupancy in October are also the sites that have the highest pine basal area. So I have our October distributions up here again with sites 2, 4, 6, and 7 highlighted. Uh, so those are the sites that had the highest mean occupancy probability, and those were also the sites that were uh, pine-dominated areas. So definitely seeing a positive association between pine, uh, pine basal area and P in Paris occupancy. All right, so what does all this mean? Well, generally, uh, again, we're seeing observed richness of insect families was higher in the REB than the traditional bioblitz, and that REB data is generally not biased to certain orders. That's interesting because uh, total survey hours was actually less in the REB than the traditional bioblitz. In the REB, we certainly sampled for more hours total. When you break it down by survey hours, you know, as far as number of participants, uh, it was actually less survey effort uh, during the REB than the traditional bioblitz, because again, that REB was just uh, myself doing the sampling rather than you know 10 to 30 participants uh, sampling during, during the traditional bio blitz. So uh, focusing on specific groups, in this case insects, utilizing a standardized sampling protocol and spatially and temporally replicating surveys increased our probability of detecting more taxa, uh, which again is what led us to that higher observed richness of insect families. Uh, this is especially true for small taxa and taxa active at only certain times of the year. And that brings us back to P in Paris. Uh, P in Paris is colloquially the winter foraging ant, so essentially it enters estivation in the warmer months, so when it gets really hot out, it seals itself up in its underground nest uh, and is effectively not available for sampling at that time. So, uh, you know, the failure to detect it in August 20, 2018 and 2019 is because it was inactive and not available to sample. Uh, so again, this highlights the necessity of sampling at multiple different times of the year. You know, P in Paris is fairly common at BCC, but it was unavailable for detection during the traditional, during the traditional bio blitz. So further, data from the REB is structured to enable estimation of occupancy and other ecological parameters. Um, our occupancy model here indicates habitat associations that could be investigated in the future. Uh, you know, that uh, association with pine-dominated woodlands, uh, that could certainly be further investigated. Our model estimates uh, here are fairly imprecise due to a small data due to a relatively small data set. However, future studies can uh, improve this by increasing spatial replication. Um, 
So again, that should be a focus on future studies. If anyone plans on replicating this design, uh, increasing spatial replication will really go a long way to improving the quality of data. So uh, in conclusion, we need more biodiversity data to help address biodiversity loss. Uh, insects are pretty woefully underrepresented in biodiversity data sets. Uh, so we definitely you know, need to focus efforts on collecting more data on insects. Data collected under the REB framework uh, can help reduce taxonomic bias for insects and can also be statistically analyzed, which is definitely an important piece of this. We don't just need more data, we need more data that can you know, allow inference uh, to ecological processes. So in our opinion, the REB is a step towards a cost-effective, efficient, and standardized means of generating biodiversity data. And I think we've demonstrated here, it could help to generate detailed insect data. It's important to note that you know, this framework isn't necessarily you know, the be-all, end-all of collecting you know, rapid biodiversity data. Uh, there's definitely wiggle room and you know, could pro probably be tweaked uh, you know, depending on the needs of whoever's conducting the bioblitz. Uh, further, you know, this applies beyond just insects. Uh, we think that this general framework can pretty much be applied to any sort of organism. Um, you, you know, again, uh, the key here is that we're trying to build something that's flexible and efficient. Uh, so hopefully we've demonstrated that here. Uh, we should also note that uh, the community outreach piece of traditional bioblitzes is certainly valuable. Um, and uh, maybe the biggest drawback to our approach here is that we lose a little bit of that community outreach thing by, uh, you know, making it a bit more standardized. Uh, you know, we think that it might be useful to uh, kind of combine community bio blitzes and um, ex uh, recurring expert bio blitzes. So, for example, you can conduct a community bio blitz with lots of volunteers doing haphazard sampling, and then on top of that, go back and do a more structured uh, approach. With that, I'd like to thank uh, the Friends of Big Canoe Creek, Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, Alabama Forever Wild, and all the participants of the 2018 BioBlitz, and everybody else that was involved with this work. Uh, my email is on the bottom there. Uh, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions, or if you'd like me to elaborate on anything, I'd be happy to talk with you. Thank you. All right. So we ran over a little bit with our time with that one. Um, so we're gonna skip this short minute break so we can stay on track. Um, we do have trivia scheduled, so we will just put that into the next break. Um, so moving on, our next presenter is Andrew Lawrence. Andy is a wildlife ecologist with Colorado State University Center for Environmental Management of Military Lands and is based at Fort Hunter Liggett in Monterey County. His work focuses on threatened and endangered species and on the interactions between wildlife and anthropogenic disturbances. So Andy, are you available? Are you with us? Yep. I see yeah. you. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yep. Sounds good. All right. I'm going to start Take it away. my screen share. And... All right. Can you see it okay? Yep, it looks great. We're good. All right. Oh, thank you, Jackie, for the introduction. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging my collaborators on this project. Jackie is one of them, um, but also Andrew Rypel from UC Davis and Laura Eliason, who's also from uh, CSU here at Fort Hunter Liggett. So I'll be discussing uh, a relatively simple project, but one that I think is uh, significant, um, especially for California. So this is just an overview of what I'll be talking about today. I'll discuss our objectives, um, a little bit about California floater natural history, um, the effects of climate change and wildfire runoff, uh, and then I'll go over our study sites, our surveys, results, and our conclusions. So our objectives were to determine the impacts of a catastrophic wildfire that we had here uh, last year and um, a subsequent extreme rainfall event uh, following that wildfire. Um, and we're interested in, in how this affected uh, population of California floater and Odonta californiensis natelliana. Um, and we took this as an opportunity to, to look at the impacts on sympatric fishes and uh, how it affected river pool characteristics. So the California floaters in our project are part of the 
Californiensis natalianic clade. Um, there's a lot of taxonomic uncertainty um, within the species. Um, so we did have these genotyped and they are genetically consistent with the coastal central California um, subclade. And uh, this may represent the southernmost population of this clade. Uh, so you can see here, this is a figure from uh, Blevins et al in 2017 that shows the, uh, the extant distribution um, and then also the uh, uncertain and possibly extinct distribution of this species. Um, that red circle that you see is the um, our study site here. Um, you can see basically everything to the south, uh, they believe is extirpated. This is a figure from Howard 2010. Uh, she described the historical distribution of Anodonta in California. Um, and then she followed up at all those sites and uh, revisited them to see if mussels were still present. Um, so the figure on the left shows the historical distribution of multiple mussel species. Um, Anodonta are the red circles. And then the updated distribution um, based on her results is on the right figure. Um, you can see our, our site again is the, the yellow circle there um, and shows that basically, I mean, across California, there was a lot of decline in mussel species. Um, and, and then almost everything in Southern California is believed to be um, extirpated. So there's some significance to um, the, the findings of a, a new mussel population here. So a little bit about the habitat characteristics of California floaters. They use a variety of different habitats. And what we found here at Fort Hunter Liga is pretty consistent um, with what's been, been described elsewhere. Uh, they'll use mud and sediments, sand, gravel, um, and uh, they'll also use lakes, reservoirs, slow moving streams, and uh, and our area here, it's a Mediterranean climate. Um, so we don't really have that, that summer precipitation. So a lot of these stretches of these creeks and rivers will, will go dry during the summer. And so they're really limited to um, these remnant perennial pools. So very importantly for um, these mussels and mussels within this, this family is that they require uh, a host fish as part of their, their reproduction. So the, the larval mussels will actually parasitize uh, uh, obligate host fish species and um, they'll get a little bit of nutrients from them, but it's also very important for dispersal too to new areas um, because once they're adults, they're pretty limited in their dispersal. Um, so based on previous studies on some potential host fish that we have here at Fort Hunter Liggett include green sunfish, uh, Sacramento pike minnow, um, sculpin, we're not really sure what species yet, um, and three-spined stickleback, and then other species that may be uh, host fish that are unconfirmed, um, but we have observed here are Monterey sucker, Monterey roach, um, largemouth bass and smallmouth bass, uh, common carp, and catfish. So mussels in general are very important. Um, they, they play an important role in ecosystem services. Uh, especially nutrient recycling. So they're, they're filter feeders <clears throat> and they're drawing um, bacteria and other nutrients out of the, the, the water column. Um, they provide structural habitat for other species, um, particularly when, when mussels die, their shells remain. Um, that create, creates structure for um, other uh, aquatic invertebrates. Um, their food for other species as well. And then uh, because they're filter feeders, they, they play an important role in water purification. Um, and because they're, they're sensitive to pollutants and um, aquatic contaminants, they are helpful as environmental monitors of water quality. And then in general too, they've, they've played an important role in, in human cultural resources um, for jewelry, for food, um, there's, some that have been used for actually creating uh, the pearl snap buttons. Um, so overall, they, they played a, a very important role in aquatic ecosystems. So shifting gears into uh, the broader environmental realm, I'm gonna discuss the importance of climate change and weather volatility for mussels. Um, climate change has really broad effects on the abundance and distribution of freshwater taxa. Um, California is a Mediterranean climate and it's susceptible to uh, rapid shifts between drought and flood. 
Um, so California's aquatic systems are especially threatened. And you can see this is a, a photo from one of our sites on the right here um, from 2021. And uh, it's about five feet lower than it was uh, last year. So this drought has had impacts on the mussels here. Um, but fortunately, it's, it's a little bit better now with the, the recent rainfall that we've had. So describing this uh, weather volatility, there was a, a study by Swain et al. from 2018. Um, and some of their findings and predictions for climate change were basically all of California is expected to experience um, increases in drought severity and frequency. Uh, so this is going to have implications for longer fire seasons and um, just general increased potential for, for wildfire. On the flip side of that, there's also expected to be an increase in the frequency of these extreme rainfall events, um, like these, these atmospheric rivers or, or bomb cyc cyclones that we get like recently, um, a couple of weeks ago, San Francisco and Sacramento sent new daily records for, for rainfall. Um, and so when you have these, these rapid shifts in um, drought to extreme precipitation events that are described as these whiplash events. And this is uh, of particular concern for areas that have experienced wildfires uh, because of the potential for, for runoff from those uh, rainfall events. So some of the products of wildfire um, on aquatic ecosystems, um, they can trigger this hydric erosion downhill and that can increase siltation and compaction of aquatic substrates. Uh, they can in introduce a lot of inorganic elements from the actual uh, fires and uh, fire residue, um, such as metalloids, metals, um, even hydrogen cyanide, that's gonna have um, serious impacts on aquatic organisms. And uh, these, these compounds are very toxic. They tend to bioaccumulate and they also tend to persist in the environment for long periods of time. So, um, some additional effects of wildfire runoff uh, can really alter water chemistry and hydrology. Um, this can create significant changes in aquatic organism abundance and community composition. Um, this large influx of nutrients into these aquatic systems can increase the conductivity, they can reduce dissolved oxygen, um, and ultimately it can, it can uh, clog gills of aquatic organisms and reduce respiration rates. Um, there have been previous studies that have found uh, significant decreases in the densities of uh, macroinvertebrates, amphibians, and fish. So what do we know about the effects of wildfire on runoff? Uh, well, there's extremely limited information available out there, um, which is part of the reason why we want to describe what we, what we observed here. Um, we do know that sedimentation and contaminants are known to be harmful um, in Extreme levels of those muscles can remain closed for prolonged periods of time. Um, it's especially harmful for juvenile muscles um, just because they don't have the, the energy reserves to uh, with, withstand those um, prolonged periods without feeding. Um, so there, there are higher rates of mortality for them. So uh, shifting gears to describe our study site here, it's in Monterey County, California. Um, it's on the US Army Garrison Fort Hunter Liggett. Uh, we have two major rivers that flow through the installation here. It's the Nascimento and the San Antonio River. Um, this photo that you here see here is the San Antonio River. Our study site is just upstream. You can see here to give you some geographical context. Um, so this is our, our muscle pool right there, that yellow triangle. Um, and then the kind of salmon pink color is the Dolan Fire burn areas. So you can see um, a lot of that area upstream of the, the muscle pool burned. So we just uh, documented um, a new population out here of these uh, California floaters while doing other aquatic surveys in 2020. Um, and we've documented it in the San Antonio River and one of its tributaries. And then we've also documented it in two tributaries of the Nascimento River. And this gives you another um, overview of the study area. So this shows the headwaters of the, um, the study site. And so our, our red circle right there is our study site. And um, it shows the extent of the, uh, the Dolan fire within that headwaters region. Um, so 
overall it burned about 128,000 acres um, and the headwaters area uh, when accounting for the topography burned about a little over 50,000 acres. And following the wildfire, um, we really didn't have any precipitation until this really heavy rainfall event in late January that dumped 15 to 20 inches over the burn scar. And so that resulted in a significant amount of runoff um, in that burn area. You can see this photo here. Um, it's actually a road next to the river under, uh, covered in several feet of sediment. Um, and so there's a heavy sediment deposition in the river as well. So in 2020, we were doing uh, surveys for mussels, and this was mainly done by snorkeling, um, uh, tried to keep it to two person hours, and we did only substrate level observations, so we weren't doing excavation of mussels uh, because there tend to be more mussels under the substrate, um, but just to limit disturbance, we only did surface level. And then following the wildfire um, and the, the rainfall event, we did visual and tactile searches, um, looking for any live or dead mussels. We extended our search area um, beyond our original sur survey area, um, just to try and increase our opportunity to, to find mussels. Um, and we did three of these surveys in 2021, in May, June, and August. Um, we also noted St. Patrick fishes, and uh, we took note of all these uh, pool characteristics and substrate characteristics. So, Pretty simply, our results, we didn't find any live mussels during our three surveys. We did find the shells of four mussels along the bank and in the stream. Um, they may have been predated, uh, but it's, it's hard to tell. Um, did not find any live mature fish. Uh, interestingly, we did find some uh, juvenile Monterey roach and Monterey suckers in our last two surveys. This shows the steady pool on February 1st. You can see that it's very highly turbid water. And this photo shows uh, at, on our last survey on August 17th, um, what used to be probably five feet deep water, um, you can walk across now, it's, it's, it's very shallow. Um, so from this figure, I'm just gonna highlight the bow egg decreased from 1.77 meters to about 0.2. And uh, we noticed the biggest change in substrate for sand, which went from about 40% to 80%. So uh, in conclusion, um, our study is one of the first to document the loss of a native freshwater population, native freshwater mussel population um, due to wildfire and um, runoff following an extreme rain event. Um, we also document the loss of mature native fishes. Um, but we also uh, note that there's survival uh, and or recolonization by juvenile fishes. And uh, we describe the substantial changes to the river substrates. Um, so mussels play a really underappreciated role in our ecosystems. Um, if we lose these mussels, we lose a lot of those ecosystem services. Um, for this situation here, it may be the extirpation of a species that has really been in decline um, throughout its range, especially in California. Um, and then it's, it's a complicated path to recovery um, because you do need host fish and because the, the, the habitat, aquatic habitat now probably wouldn't support um, mature fish. So you're gonna have a, a reduction in uh, reproduction or just potential for um, any mussels that, that may be there. Um, or if we were translocating mussels into that area, um, it's gonna be hard to, to do that without the, the native host fish. So um, climate change is also inducing significant changes in the occurrence, intensity, and duration of wildfires across the US. Um, the impacts of these shifts on aquatic ecosystems and taxa, they're, they're not really well known, um, but it has been identified as a topic that uh, is really of interest to most aquatic ecologists. Um, and if the, the results of this study are really broadly applicable, applicable then um, the increased wildfires and wildfire runoff will really drastically alter abundance and distribution of other freshwater mussels across the, uh, the Western USA. So we have some ongoing future work. Uh, we're still continuing to describe the, the status and distribution of mussel species at Fort Hunter Liggett. Uh, we're working on a phylogeographic analysis. 
um, partnered for some eDNA surveys, a host fish study, and describing habitat associations. So many thanks to these folks here for helping with field work. Brooke was, was very helpful in all that. Um, uh, Karen for genotyping um, analysis and others just for, for just helping to describe and, and teach me a little bit more about muscle ecology because I'm not really trained in uh, aquatic ecology. So with that, I will take any questions. That was awesome, Andy. Thank you. It's it's really neat to see this all put together in a presentation, um, even though I've been kind of on the sidelines watching what you're <laughs> doing. <laughs> uh, just one little note that I thought I'd, I'd add out to the community. Um, that burn was in one region of a watershed out on Tenderliga, and there are mussels throughout both rivers. So uh, we should still have plenty of mussels after this, and we're really hoping um, to see some other mussels populations come back, um, hopefully because we have the host fish in there, and also to point out too that this is not the first catastrophic fire that's happened at Hunter Liggett. Of course, it's the, the wild card in there is that uh, rainfall following and the sedimentation following that event. Um, Wonderful job. That was really great. I, I don't have any questions in the chat. Does any, oh, wait, yes, we do have a question that just came in from Jan. What is known about muscle recolonization timelines and streams would be very interesting to follow up. Um, yeah, so I, I think part of the, the recolonization, um, I, I'm still kind of too new to the muscle field, so um, I can't really cite any examples of that right now. Um, but I would say it's really dependent on the ability of of host fish to to transport those muscles, because um, muscles need those host fish to be able to disperse, um, and they're not just kind of releasing their their larval muscles into the water and letting them drift down. They actually need to attach to a host fish for about two or three weeks. They're getting some nutrients from that. And in that same process, they're, they're moving and being dispersed to other parts of that aquatic system. Um, so I would say the, the timeline of that really depends on um, the timeline of when those host fish are able to recover in these streams too. Wonderful. Well, if there's any other questions that pop in, Andy, can you just watch the chat for a little bit and answer yep. those? Thank you. Yeah, Great. Well, I'd like to move on in our schedule. Uh, we're a little behind, uh, but that's fine because we'll make up for it in our break. Our next presenter is Estelle Sandhouse. Estelle is the Director of Conservation and Science at the Santa Barbara Zoo, where she oversees the zoo's field conservation programs and collections research. Her research interests include animal behavior, conservation biology, and animal welfare. So Estelle, are you with us today? I'm here. <laughs> oh, there she is. Hi, Estelle. Thank you. Are we set to share? All right, sure are you is. I can see it. All right, excellent. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, everyone for coming to my talk today. Um, I'm going to give a high level overview of the role of the Santa Barbara Zoo in Island Fox uh, conservation recovery. It's a supporting role uh, working together with lead federal uh, and state agencies, land managers, and other NGOs. Uh, and I wanted to just briefly provide some background on you know, why zoos and island foxes. And broadly in terms of conservation, you know, recent history shows us that successful conservation by zoos and aquariums um, is achievable and successful. You know, close to 25 species uh, have been saved by AZA zoos and aquariums and over 40 species have been reintroduced into the wild through AZA managed breeding programs. And I would say the latter is what people tend to think of when they think of zoo and aquarium uh, role in conservation. And this is definitely the case, uh, but our involvement is broader than that. Um, and Fox conservation is a really great example of that. Um, just to you know, speak a little bit to visitor reach, it's such an incredible opportunity. We all know that conservation challenges really are at their heart uh, people challenges. And you know, AZA zoos and aquariums have a massive audience. Uh, we have 
195 million visitors a year. And so, you know, this is uh, primarily North American zoos and Amer uh, aquariums. And that's more than the attendance at, um, than of all of our combined pro sports team events nationwide in the US. Um, you know, we're really well known and trusted in our communities as family institutions. And we also have this, you know, really unique reach in that not all of the families um, or visitors who come to see us are primarily concerned with conservation or wildlife necessarily. Uh, they may come in our doors for other reasons, a fun outdoor day with their family. Um, and so we can actually have a broader reach behind a, um, beyond a, a focused conservation demographic. Um, and that's especially important given our increasingly urban population. Uh, zoos are one way to really connect people to wildlife and nature in an inclusive manner. Um, and we do have expertise in education, marketing, communications, uh, related social science, fields. And, you know, something I think that is sometimes lost, um, you know, in, in the discussion is that we're also able to engage folks um, in these activities without impacting sensitive ecosystems and recovery actions. Um, you know, this is certainly true for foxes, but, you know, you might think of um, the condor refuges that we have in Southern California. Those are generally uh, close to the public uh, for the protection of the sensitive work happening on the refuges, but we are able to, you know, bring people into the zoo um, and, and really connect them with condors in a safe manner. So given our location um, in the beautiful Central Coast, we at Santa Barbara Zoo focus heavily on local conservation. Uh, with the fox in particular, that makes it logistically feasible for staff from uh, many different departments to not only assist on the islands, but for our guests to view uh, the islands of this habitat uh, from vantage points near the fox exhibit. Uh, and I, I, you know, I think probably most folks in this symposium are pretty familiar with the fox story. So I'll, you know, just briefly, you know, four of the six island fox subspecies uh, had declined precipitously in the 90s. Um, and the zoo's been involved with this integrated uh, fox recovery team uh, since 1999. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, added the four subspecies of island fox to uh, federal endangered species list in March 2004. And in the wild, the different uh, threats faced by the foxes, um, you know, really a lot of um, ecosystem interactions. So uh, predation by golden eagles, uh, that was, you know, really enabled by um, the decline of bald eagles um, from eggshell thinning from DDT, um, habitat destruction by feral pigs, um, you know, enabled hyperpredation, um, you know, uh, to develop with these golden eagles, um, and then on uh, Catalina Island canine distemper. And so a large group of stakeholders was working together on these ecosystem level conservation actions, including restoration of bald eagle populations, uh, relocation of golden eagles, uh, removal of invasive species, and a vaccination program. So our location um, just off the coast uh, sets up a beautiful area for storytelling. So almost half a million people will visit the Santa Barbara Zoo annually. 94% of these visitors are from California and uh, over half of them are from Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. So in the case of the Fox, uh, people can view them up close, learn from our animal care staff and educators. You know, we've been holding special events over the years, like the Fox Festival. Um, we have partners um, from the Fox program, uh, you know, come, you know, do outreach at these events, um, whether it's, you know, Friends of the Island Fox or the Park Service. Um, and then Fox have also been um, historically and currently exhibited at a number of other zoos. So Los Angeles Zoo, the Living Desert, Orange County Zoo, San Diego Zoo. So there really is a, um, a regional effort here to educate um, and do outreach. And at our zoo alone, we've had a number of Fox residents that have really resonated in the community and touched hearts. I think um, probably a number of you on this symposium uh, may have known Finnegan. He's probably our best known um, Fox ambassador. He'd been hand reared at the zoo due to mastitis and his mom. And so due to this hand rearing, he was incredibly comfortable with people. Um, and so he met thousands of guests. Um, we also accept orphan or non-releasable foxes for medical care and permanent placement. Um, Bo um, from San Clemente Island was well known, um, cared for by U.S. Navy wildlife biologists on the islands, uh, didn't have survival skills, so came to uh, be an ambassador fox here at the zoo. Um, and currently you can see Lewis and Clark. Uh, they were abandoned uh, pups found on San Clemente as well, and they were brought to the zoo for care. 
one benefit of animals in zoo care is we're able to get data that we could not feasibly get uh, from wild animals, uh, like very detailed growth trajectories of cubs. Um, or very detailed activity budgets, although I will say, um, you know, this was many years ago and prior to the more widespread uh, spread implementation of, say, accelerometers. Uh, but again, you know, because we're able to handle uh, the animals in our care, um, it, it just allows us to look at research questions that otherwise may not be feasible. And for the rest of my brief talk, I just wanted to shift and um, move away from the mainland a little bit. Uh, traditionally, folks think of the role of zoos for captive breeding um, in situ for later release. With the case of the fox, um, the decline of foxes in the Northern Channel Islands led to a captive breeding program by the Park Service. Um, but for biosecurity and space reasons, the breeding facilities were actually constructed on the islands themselves. And although they were not constructed in, say, a zoo, like in the Condor program, um, there was an important zoo collaboration. And so though the land uh, management agencies were very experienced in trapping, handling, and studying island foxes, uh, the zoos had experience in animal husbandry of other small canids, record keeping, small population management, and veterinary care. So we were able to host husbandry workshops with all of the stakeholders and uh, develop husbandry standards with stakeholders, um, work together to coordinate husbandry knowledge, um, and bring other AZA resources to the table, uh, like stud books and population management. And of course, from the early days of the fox recovery work, um, zoo staff have assisted in the field as well. Because we have experienced animal keepers who are um, good at animal handling, um, these skills transfer very easily to uh, running transects, et cetera, with minimal handling time. And as a zoo, of course, we have veterinarians whose expertise is zoo and wildlife medicine. Uh, they provided assistance over the years for both the captive breeding population on the Northern Islands and as needed wild foxes. Um, so helping with annual health monitoring, health assessments, um, you know, whether it's evaluating ectoparasite concerns, performing ultrasounds, um, and then also contributing to the Vox uh, Recovery Veterinary Health Group. Uh, we've also been coordinating uh, vaccines for a number of years, um, including, you know, fundraisers, donations, and a discount purchasing program. So happily, uh, the intensive conservation efforts um, with many, many stakeholders uh, were successful. The populations rebounded. In 2016, the three listed fox species on the Northern Islands were delisted, and the fourth subspecies on Catalina Island um, you know, four out of the six that had been listed, uh, was downlisted from endangered to threatened. And this represents uh, the fastest successful recovery of any Endangered Species Act listed mammal in the US. And is really uh, a beacon of hope, not, not just for biologists, but really for the public and policymakers. And so, you know, although program partners are still keeping a very uh, close, watchful eye on these island populations, um, this remains a story of hope for endangered species conservation. I uh, just wanted to, you know, mention many conservation partners working on these programs, uh, agencies, NGOs, et cetera. And then, um, of course, our biggest conservation supporters at the zoo are our members and guests. Um, and I'm just noticing um, as I'm finishing up, um, bald, okay, great question in the chat. Did I say that bald eagles were affected by DDT and not golden eagles? So my understanding and, you know, other folks who study raptors on the islands, I, I think I've seen some of you guys maybe on here. Um, so bald eagles are primarily, um, they eat fish as a big part of their diet. And so um, they are going to be affected at a higher level um, from the concentration of DDT in the food chain. And golden eagles are a little bit more terrestrial feeding. Um, and actually that was part of the challenge. So when golden eagles were able to set up territories on the islands, um, you know, foxes were really not adapted to having um, an aerial predator that was focused on terrestrial small mammals. But um, yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> so yeah, that's it for my slides. But do we have any other questions? I know I blew for the, through that pretty quickly. <laughs> that was wonderful, Estelle. Thank you. Oh, yes, there's, we've got more questions coming in. Um, oh, yeah, I that's a really see that. good question about genetics. Yeah, so um, genetics is not my expertise. Um, I know that um, there have been bottlenecks in, you know, documented, um, gosh, in at least one of the subspecies that I'm aware of, but to my understanding, the pop, those were historical, and to my understanding, the populations are, are fairly healthy now. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> but yes, the, 
one of the reasons why we have the genetic management is, is to ensure that that's the case. Great, do we have any other questions? Okay, well, if anybody thinks of any, please add them to our chat. And Estelle, you can hang out a little bit and watch those questions as they come in. That was fantastic. Uh, I love it. I haven't been to the zoo for a little while and it's one of my favorite places to take the kids. So we're looking forward to going back again soon. Awesome. Yeah, come see Lewis and Clark. They are yeah. they're pretty uh, cute. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, moving on in our schedule, we uh, we had uh, Lindsay PV Reeves scheduled to present, but I was told we're having an issue with her presentation at the moment. So what we're going to do, um, unfortunately, Lindsay is actually not here today. Uh, so we are going to post her presentation on our website and we'll also run it at the end of our symposium today. So if anybody wants to hang out and watch her presentation, it's really, really interesting on sanctuary soundscape monitoring around the Channel Islands. Um, and then we'll probably also invite her to come back as a uh, lecture for us. So with that, let's go ahead and take our long deserved break. But right as uh, before you take off, we have some trivia questions to get you warmed up for the quiz bowl this afternoon. Steph, are you available to start that? Yes, I am. Um, I am going to drop a link to our kind of virtual quiz bowl quiz. So if you are interested in participating that, go ahead and do so. And I'll say that the winner will be announced at the next break and that will be the person with the most right answers in the least amount of time. Um, hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So um, thanks all for your participation in advance. All right, thank you. So we will come back at 1045 and begin our next talk. See you soon. Buddy, we are getting the next talk lined up and I am going to pass over the hosting duties to Sean, our president elect. Um, quick notes though, for those of you who may have just joined us, we are, would love to see you all renew your membership. So we're putting links into the chat for that. And you can also find links on our website. Um, we're also posting a link to the, to the schedule, which is a PDF and it has links to all of our sponsors and our contributors are on there as well. And we're also open for nominations for officers for our board right now as well. We'll be closing that at the end of the month and we'll hold elections in December to get somebody on board, uh, to get several people on board for our board next year, uh, which will be, they'll be initiated in at the Western section meeting in February. Sean, do we have you? Yeah, I'm here. Can oh, you hear there me? you are. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm here. gonna pass the reins over to you. So take it away, Sean. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Jackie. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Wagoner. I'm president-elect um, for our chapter. I'm excited to be here and uh, um, you know, present speakers for the second half of the, of the presentation of the uh, symposium. So I'd like to introduce um, uh, Abrielle uh, Goodwin. She is a originally from Monterey Bay area and she received her bachelor's of science in biology from uh, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. She is currently attending veterinary school at Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona, California. She has always had a fascination with California's native and threatened wildlife species and hopes to pursue a career in wildlife conservation medicine. And she has a uh, pre-recorded video that um, will be, um, will be uh, taken away right now. And she is not present, unfortunately, but um, questions can be emailed to her and that will be put in the chat. So thanks. All right, and please let me know if the sound doesn't work for this as well, or if the volume needs to, to be increased. I'm pretty sure I got that sorted out. 
Hello everyone, my name is Abril Goodwine and I'm a third year veterinary student at Western University um, in Pomona, California. Um, I apologize for not being able to present to you live today, but um, on Zoom University, they like to change our schedule around um, last minute, um, but I do appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, still send in a recording of my talk of what I did over the summer. So my research project was characterization of injuries associated with fishing gear in California seabirds. Um, just some objectives of the talk. I'm going to talk about background and um, why we did the study itself, um, how we did it, um, the results that we got, and then some conclusions and takeaways. So along the California coast, um, specifically in Southern California, we know that there's heavy human traffic and with correspondingly heavy recreational fishing activities. Um, and it's common that our native aquatic bird species become entangled in um, that recreational fishing gear, and it can lead to some pretty significant morbidity and mortality. And we know that fishing lines can constrict um, important extremities, uh, they can lacerate tissues and lead to infections, um, or they can cut off blood circulation and cause necrosis of the entire um, limb or extremity that it's um, constricting. Fishing hooks um, are commonly ingested, which can lead to GI perforation. Um, they can penetrate um, and cause damage to crucial muscles, tendon, or bones. Um, and we just know that any injuries associated with this can lead to fatalities associated with that bird. So previous studies have described the prevalence of fishing gear uh, related injuries in seabirds regionally along the California coast, um, but none have looked at the injuries themselves and trying to characterize them. So the purpose of our study was to objectively characterize uh, the, and describe the nature of fishing gear associated injuries in birds in order to create a standardized injury characterization system. Um, for our methods, uh, fishing gear and medical records from birds admitted for rehabilitation um, due to fishing gear injuries at International Bird Rescue and some cooperating facilities, notably uh, Wildlife Care Network. Um, those were collected from December 2020 to July 2021, um, and that was just to kind of get insight as to what gear we were dealing with. Um, and then we um, similarly pulled medical records back from um, January of 2018, um, again, all the way up until 2021, um, and we evaluated um, the descriptions of the injuries themselves, and then documented some of that demographic information about each bird, um, and that was all put into a very large Excel spreadsheet. Um, and so using those descriptions um, from the medical records and then also descriptions that were found in um, human literature and then um, injury staging methods in um, our animal literature as well, um, we constructed an objective characterization system specific to fishing gear injuries in birds. So that fishing gear characterization stage was then, staging system was then applied back to the um, approximately 300 medical records that we collected from 2018 to 2021. Um, and then just to note if multiple injuries were documented, which that was the case in most of these, um, the most severe injury itself was used for the characterization. So this is kind of a little snapshot of the gear that we collected from that December 2020 date to 2021. Um, our fishing lines that were collected consisted of monofilament or braided fishing line. Um, in box A, that's our braided, that blue line, that blue fishing line is braided line, and that was confirmed under a microscope. And then um, B, that plastic monofilament line can be kind of seen um, a little transparent there, but um, still visible. Um, for hook types, we saw an array of different hooks, um, but our repeat offenders were the treble hook and the bait holder hook. And those are seen in boxes C and D. The treble hook is that three-pronged hook in box C. And then D, we can see our kind of more J hook with the um, prongs on the backside. So this is kind of a snapshot of our um, fishing line injury characterization system. It was a four stage system ranging from mild to moderate, um, stage one through four. And stage one consisted of a loose line entanglement, um, intact skin, so no lacerations, but there could have been some local color change in the area where the line was in, coming into contact. Um, and then our more severe stage, um, jumping to stage four, um, a tight full body line entanglement where the bird had no ability to extend its wings or um, didn't have ability to use its legs. Um, it could also be a tight line entanglement that was deeply embedded in the skin um, if there was full thickness um, tissue loss. And then also in this case, if there was damage um, or necrosis to the bone tendon or muscle, that was considered a severe stage four injury. 
Um, in our fishing, for our fishing hook injury characterization stages, again, mild to severe stage one through four. Um, our mild um, stage one consisted of a singular hook penetration, really superficial through the skin, easily removable, no infection present, maybe some redness associated with that puncture wound. Um, in contrast, our stage four consisted of one or more hook penetrations, um, deep hook penetration, so um, causing injury or damage to any muscle, tendon, or bone. Um, if the hook was in contact with a joint or caused damage to a joint, um, that was a severe stage four. And then also, um, if the hook was ingested, that was also categorized as a stage four um, injury. Um, here are just some examples. Um, on the left in image two, we can see there's a hook um, involved in that um, distal tibiotarsis of the Western gull and kind of penetrating into that joint. Um, on the increased magnification, we can see that there's bony lysis or um, bone breakdown in that area and some inflammation around that area. So that bird ended up being humanely euthanized. Um, in the image three with the three images, um, there in box A, we have a necrotic foot um, and that was due to a constriction um, injury um, higher on the leg. But again, that was a stage four as the, the limb itself was um, dying off basically because it had no blood circulation. Um, in box B, that was a stage three injury. We can see evidence of um, tendon um, being shown there, but there was no um, damage to the tendon itself. So it was not, um, so that was categorized as stage three. And then in box C, that is also, that's a hook injury. Um, and that was categorized as a stage three um, hook injury due to that deeper penetration, um, but no um, severe damage to that muscle. Um, this is a radiograph of a Western gull that had ingested a hook. Um, and this was just kind of showing um, how easily in that small structure the hook can um, penetrate out of that, out of that GI tract. So we looked at the proportion of injuries in each stage. Um, on the left, we have the proportion of injuries um, attributed to fishing line. And we can see that um, almost half of those injuries resulted in a severe stage four injury. Um, on the right, we have the proportion of injuries attributed to fishing hooks in each characterization stage. And we can see that um, almost three quarters of those injuries from hooks resulted in a stage four severe um, injury characterization. So pretty significant. We also looked at rates of survival to release. And while they varied between the different characterization stages um, in both hooks and um, fishing lines, we did note um, that in that stage four category for both, they did have um, a lower rate of survival to release. Um, we also looked at um, commissure wounds and um, their relation to hook ingestion. So um, it had anecdotally been suggested that if there is a wound in the commissure of the bird, or basically that junction of the jaw where that red circle is, um, that we could assume that there was a hook ingested. And so that red circle is indicating that wound in the commissure area, and there's like a necrotic um, plug in there that, um, that is indicating that injury. And so we looked at um, birds that had no commissure wounds and birds that did have commissure wounds. And we can see that in that, um, that right bar that the, of those that had commissure wounds, um, the higher proportion of those birds had hooks ingested. And we did run stats on that. Um, and there was evidence to suggest a relationship between commissure wounds and hook ingestion. So to conclude, we did create an applicable um, objective staging system to um, look at fishing gear related injuries in birds. Um, that staging system can aid in standardizing fishing gear injury, injury documentation across rehabilitation facilities, and it can ease um, data sharing um, and allow it to be more convenient um, for further investigation into the effects of various gear um, and their associated injuries. And also, um, if we have more concrete stats while using this objective system, um, it has the ability to further generate data to influence um, future fishing gear regulation if we're finding that um, one type of gear is causing way more damage than another. Um, we found that over half the birds had injuries characterized as moderate or severe, um, and that it just highlights the, the severity of the damage that this gear can cause um, on our on our bird species. But we also did want to note um, that there is the confounding variable of chronicity. Um, in which it's hard to evaluate because we don't know when these birds are coming first in contact with the fishing gear itself. We're only in rehabilitation facilities. We're only getting them um, when they have they have hit the certain point where um, they cannot escape being 
you know, brought in for rehabilitation, um, or they've just gotten to the point where um, the injury is so severe. So we might be a little skewed in our data sampling in that sense. Um, we found that the survival rate to release varied between the stages for hooks and lines. Um, and this, there's some, a couple possibilities for this. It can be due to the frequency of medical management procedures influencing that, any comorbidities the bird had, um, and again, the skewed sample size, we're only getting those that are more severe um, in injuries. So um, we do need a greater sample size and over a longer period of time needed to confirm um, and gain more insight into um, survival rates. Same thing, we did find evidence to suggest a relationship between common shrew wounds and hook ingestion. Um, but again, larger sample sizes are needed for analysis um, to further support that relationship. Um, but overall, results stress the need for responsible recreational fishing activities um, and further outreach and education regarding this so we can um, work towards a more sustainable fishing practices that preserve our coastal bird species. Um, special thanks to the Western University Office of Research and the CVM Office of Research for funding. Um, my research mentor, Dr. Curtis Ang, and um, the wonderful Dr. Rebecca Dewar and International Bird Rescue, along with the cooperating facilities that um, allowed me to um, gather data. And um, I appreciate you guys all listening to my talk. Um, and unfortunately, I can't answer questions live, but please feel free to email me with any questions or comments, and I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. All right, that was a great uh, video by Abrielle. Uh, next, we're gonna move over to uh, um, Julie Howard. Um, Julie, you're here. Um, she is a uh, biologist, GIS specialist, and data manager at Point Blues Lompo Field Station. She likes to play outside. Out, she likes to play outside and look at seabirds at Vandenberg Space Force Base. And when she's not figuring out new Esri apps and database tricks, I believe she also has a pre-recorded talk. And she is present for questions after that, though. Give me one second to get it lined up. My screen share got rid of some uh, full screen options. So give me one sec. No problem, Jamie. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your time and interest. I'm Julie Hauer. I work for Point Blue Conservation Science. And today I'm going to talk about a tool my coworkers, Dan Robinette, Jamie Miller, Ryan Anderson, and I are developing called Seabird Aware. We intend Seabird Aware to be a data repository and a source of information about seabird populations and the human and factors that influence them in coastal areas. Marine animals use the coast to forage, rest, and reproduce, but human activities are increasingly coming into conflict with these basic needs. There are concerned people who see these impacts but don't know what to do about them, and there are managers who want to work on the issues but don't have information on which to act. Without baseline knowledge of animal populations on the coast, as well as documented impact of human activity on wildlife behavior and populations, it is difficult to develop solutions that are beneficial to both wildlife and people. We want Seabird Aware to give people who are interested in their local seabird populations the means by which to share standardized and repeated data with managers and groups who provide outreach and education to coastal users. First, we aim to coordinate a network of organizations collecting seabird population and disturbance data. Second, we want to inform the public by involving the public through community science efforts and collection of and utilization of these data. Finally, we want to provide these data to organizations that will target outreach efforts to guide management actions and reduce human impacts on birds and other marine wildlife. As human populations increase in coastal areas, so does the pressure on coastal ecosystems and resident wildlife. People like to go to the coast to spend time at the beach, participate in ocean activities, and enjoy wildlife viewing. Seeing wildlife animals in close proximity is a highly memorable experience. 
Unfortunately, interactions between humans and coastal wildlife sometimes results in altering the animal's behavior to the animal's detriment. Often these events aren't perceived as problematic by the people perpetuating them. Some feel that they're simply enjoying the wildlife of the area without realizing the impact of their actions. There are many individuals and groups who enjoy bird watching and spending time in their local coastal areas, and they want to take their observations to the level of shareable data. However, they're unsure of how to do that or what to do when they see disturbance events. They're concerned about increasing human impacts on local seabird populations, and they want to do something about it. Seabird Aware can provide groups like these with a monitoring program for seabird populations and disturbance recording. In addition, Seabird Aware can also provide information to organizations such as the Bureau of Land Management and California State Parks, who are interested and able to provide outreach and education that meets the needs of local issues, especially on the lands that they manage. Using data provided by community scientists and other monitors, these organizations can focus their efforts and improve the experience for visitors and residents, both humans and wildlife. The purpose of Seabird Aware is to create partnerships and bring these entities together to allow for data sharing as well as communication of disturbance observations so that they can be assessed and addressed. This is intended to be a standardized process with interested community scientists participating in scheduled surveys to collect data, which is then summarized and made available through visualization tools online. This data can be used to inform managers and support their education and outreach events. So how can we do this? Seabird Aware will enable the collection and storage of baseline population data as well as disturbance observations. This baseline data can be useful for following trends over time and allow for further comparative analysis. We plan to provide standardized field protocols, online and mobile data entry tools, data visualization tools, and links to our partners as well as outreach materials and coastal monitoring reports. While the website is currently live, it is still in development with some changes and updates expected soon. Seabird Aware is meant to foster an active relationship between its developers and its users. We have designed a survey protocol that community scientists can follow to provide standardized data and a measure of effort. This protocol is based on surveys conducted from 2010 to 2015 for the Marine Life Protection Act seabird population assessments. However, if other similar data are available, their structure may be amenable to comparison with these data. For example, we will include data from the Fairlawns and other Point Blue study sites. Our aim is comparability of data between sites and years. To bring raw field observations into Seabird Aware, we have designed an online and mobile data entry tool through ESRI's Survey123. It is not uncommon to have limited or no cellular access near the coast. However, the mobile data entry tool allows offline data recording and will upload data when Wi-Fi is available again. Data can also be recorded on traditional data sheets and entered at home on a computer using the same app. Online training videos and documents for data collection and data entry will become available as the need arises. The data are housed at ESRI, but can be made available to interested parties. Data analysis and visualization are made available at the Seabird Aware website. Currently, there are maps that indicate density at individual observation locations and line graphs showing population trends. We are looking into ways to present disturbance data as well. For example, this is one illustration of disturbance rates and variation over time. These charts represent actual data from four years of disturbance monitoring at a state park on the top and a tourist destination on the bottom. Circle size represents the relative disturbance rate 
and colors are the disturbance points of origin. From these data, we can take home the message that the tourist site experiences more disturbance, but that rates and sources do vary over time. Outreach efforts might be best focused on land at the state park, whereas at the tourist site, those efforts should be directed toward the water-based disturbances. The website offers coastal monitoring reports and outreach tools that can be printed and distributed. We also provide a link to the Seabird Aware brochure and to our partner, the Seabird Protection Network, which hosts a number of posters, brochures, and narratives about disturbance reduction. With a standardized system of observing and reporting disturbance and its impacts, we can provide managers with information to help them support local resources and reduce disturbance. We are actively seeking people who are interested in participating in this project, either through data contribution or for outreach. So if you or anyone you know wants more information, please contact Dan or myself at our email addresses here. And I wanted to say thank you again for your time. Um, my email address is on the bottom and I am here today. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. All right, that was a great presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions for Julie before we move on? We have a maybe a quick minute or two for one question. If not, we will keep plugging away. Looks like I don't see any questions. I think we're gonna keep moving along. Thank you, Julie. For that. So I, you bet. I was just gonna say, if there are any, I'll be here for a while so I can fix right. yep. the chat too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sticking around for um, to answer any questions in the chat. So you bet. Great. I'm gonna we're gonna move on to our next talk. Um, uh, Ryan Borbor is here. He is gonna be speaking on. Um, uh, uh, feeding in root, studying the diet of migrant raptors. Ryan is finishing up a PhD degree at, in ecology at UC Davis. His graduate research is focused on raptor migration and raptors in agriculture. So Ryan, if you're here, um, go ahead and share your screen and take it away. Uh, thanks, Sean, for that introduction and um, hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to my talk. Um, like Sean said, I'm a PhD candidate at UC Davis, um, currently trying to transition out of grad school. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the foraging ecology of migrating raptors. So predator-prey interactions um, drive evolution and are really the underpinnings of ecosystems around the world. And as you are most likely aware, predator-prey interactions have gotten a lot of attention in the field of ecology. But despite all that research attention these interactions receive, um, we still have very limited understanding of these interactions for species in difficult to study life history stages like migration. So this map on the right is showing raptor migration routes um, around the world. And as you can imagine, predator-prey interactions are occurring across these large geographic areas spanning thousands of kilometers. And it's nearly, impossible to observe them all in an empirical way. Um, but from what we do know um, and understand, um, predator-prey um, dynamics between migrating raptors and their prey may shape migration strategies. So this data gap is really important to address. Um, some hypotheses suggest that raptors should even migrate with their prey um, to increase hunting opportunities and route, especially for um, inexperienced juveniles on their first migration. Um, it's even been hypothesized that migratory ape and prey have evolved strategies to avoid migrating with their predators. Um, so there's definitely some theory generated around this um, concept, and but very limited um, studies that are that can really uh, focus on it. Um, but out of those limited studies, there's been some evidence found of prey tracking or prey selection on migration for raptors. Um, for example, one study found that migrant raptor and songbird abundance are correlated in space and time um, at a migration monitoring station. And another study found that migrant raptors may actually, actually be selecting energetically rewarding prey more often than their relative abundance would expect, uh, would, would, um, you know, than we would expect given their relative abundance. 
However, what's really lacking in the literature are detailed descriptions of raptor migration diet um, and important or critical prey species that they rely, rely on to fuel their uh, migration, especially for raptors that hunt regularly um, that need to feed almost daily. So what I'm, what I'm gonna be presenting to you today is the bulk of my dissertation research. And first, um, our first objective was to one, develop a genetic technique to collect and identify trace prey DNA during migration. So this would be a, process, uh, a method we can apply at the end of um, a banding, the banding process at a raptor migration monitoring station to see if we could you know, describe what these raptors are eating. And then next, take that method and apply it and describe the foraging ecology of bird eating raptors migrating along the Pacific coast of California. So these are the stars of the show um, for the next 15 minutes, uh, Merlins and Sharpshin Hawks. And we sample both these species in um, 2015 and 2016 fall migration. And we chose to look at these two species um, because they're both bird specialists. Their, um, their uh, diet consists of, you know, for Merlins, more than 85% uh, small songbirds and Sharpshin Hawks, um, over 95% of their diet is small songbirds. And they both continuously hunt on migration. So if they don't eat in a few days, they will starve. Um, this is the Pacific Flyway um, Migration Corridor. And this is our study system. And we're essentially studying a migrating food web with this study, where these raptors are migrating with their avian prey. We collected our samples at the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory, just north of San Francisco. And the Golden Gate Raptor Observatory is a nonprofit. It's a long-term migration, um, raptor migration monitoring station powered by um, over 100 um, community science volunteers. And this location is known as a migration bottleneck. So a really perfect place to um, study raptor migration in California. It's where raptors converge at the shortest water crossing um, um, before crossing the San Francisco Bay and migrating, um, continuing their migration south. And another phenomenon to kind of point out um, that's worth noting is um, in, along the California coast, almost um, 90 to 95% of the raptors that use that route are hatchier birds or juvenile birds on their first migration. Mostly thought um, they don't know the lay of the land. They know they have to migrate south. And so following that coastline um, makes a lot of sense for them. So jumping right into our methods for this research, um, so we developed the swabbing technique for the exterior of beaks and talons to collect trace prey DNA. Um, this was because um, in the field, this was quick, easy, and non-invasive for a bird already in hand and going through the branding process. For the lab side of things, um, it also minimized the amount of predator DNA that we would potentially collect, um, which might be higher if we use other um, dietary study uh, methods, um, which could be problematic for barcoding studies. And just to give you kind of a visual aid of what the sampling process looked like, um, folks that participated in the study often described this as giving these migrant raptors a spa treatment, because when we release them back into the sky, they have really pristine beaks and talons and feet. Um, next, um, we extracted prey DNA from those swab tips and amplified a segment referred to as a CO1 gene or a genetic barcode. This gene is an especially good genetic marker for differentiating between avian taxa, and it's already well um, documented and cataloged in public databases. And we use a DNA meta barcoding approach. So each molecule of DNA would be sequenced individually, and this would allow us to detect and differentiate between multiple prey species if they are present in a single swab sample. And to identify um, the DNA sequences of species, we made a custom reference library of over 200 bird species that occur in the Pacific Flyway um, that were previously archived in genetic databases. And then next, after bioinformatics, um, we referenced our sequences to this reference library um, and it matched with over 99% um, bootstrap support. And so this is like a really um, simplified overview of the method for this um, raptor migration diet study. So I'll just jump right into the results. Um, and the, this method worked a lot better than we had anticipated. So we were really excited about that. Um, just a really quick summary. Um, 
we detected um, over about 90 on, uh, we, we detected prey DNA on about 90% of the birds that we sample. So really good um, return on that sampling effort. Um, this broke down to about three um, unique prey species detected per individual raptor we sampled, um, over 200 prey items uh, for migrant merlins over in the two migration seasons, over 1400 prey items for um, migrant sharks and hawks. Um, this broke down further into 40 unique prey species for merlins and 69 prey species for sharks and hawks. And we really wanted to assess our sampling effort because um, this method was brand new. So we used verifaction curves um, for each species and we feel like we captured a really good representation um, a migration diet for these two species based on these curves. So um, because both these species exhibit reverse sexual size dimorphism where females are larger than males, we were interested in any signal of prey size selection differences between um, the two sexes. So since females um, are larger than males, we hypothesized their diet would consist of larger, more energetically rewarding prey. So we use um, linear mixed effects models, which showed that females actually do significantly consume, on average, larger prey than males. And this was actually true for both species. So um, a really cool, you know, an expected finding, but really cool that our data was able to show this. And then looking further at this um, concept, um, we classified prey as small, medium, or large to compare the male and female um, prey size selection. Um, we used two proportion Z tests with von Fronie corrections. And we did find for sharps and hawks that both sexes consume small and medium um, sized prey in relatively similar proportions, but females um, on average were um, selecting larger prey than their male counterparts. And this was true also for Merlin. So a really cool finding and something that would almost be virtually impossible to detect um, with just visual op observations. So based on previous theory and literature that migrating raptors rely on migrant songbirds to fuel their migration, we wanted to investigate how the proportions of migrant and resident songbird prey shifted over the migration season. So for Merlins, we used a generalized additive model where we compared the proportion of migrant songbirds, um, these are partial and complete migrants, um, to resident songbirds um, across time in the migration season. And what we found was, um, you know, we found that Merlin diet was comprised of significantly higher proportions of migrant songbirds um, compared to residents during uh, peak songbird migration, um, which was really exciting and just supports the hypothesis that these migrating raptors are relying on um, migratory songbirds, uh, at least um, on some leg of their migration journey. And to further analyze the differences between the two sampling years, um, we classified prey as regular migrants. So these are partial and complete migrants um, in California um, as um, regular migrants, residents, or eruptive migrants. And we just, we used a two proportion Z test with a von Fronie correction. And we found support that regular migrants are really just um, an important part of the diet for these migrating raptors. Um, this was true for both years. Um, and then we also found a um, really surprise finding, which was, um, we didn't really plan for this, but in 2015, there was an eruptive songbird migration of um, cone crop species, so like red breasted nuthatches and pine siskins in Northern California. And we actually found that signal in the diet for these migrating raptors. So it was a really cool connection between raptor migration ecology and some unrelated phenomenon that causes um, uh, songbird eruptions in these um, cone crop species. And we actually, oops, skipping ahead, we actually found the same signal in both of these bird eating uh, or these bird specialists. Um, so really exciting to see that in our data. So the developed of uh, the Swabi method and um, the Merlin migration diet study are both um, published and available as of um, earlier this year. Um, but we're taking the Sharps and Hawk migration diet data um, one step further. So we're currently um, setting up and using uh, multivariate models to investigate how prey on the landscape over time influences prey detections um, in Sharps and Hawk migration diet um, and how that changes within a migration season. So preliminarily, we um, made comparisons of diet composition and prey availability 
um, at our sampling site during peak migration using songbird mistnet data. And shown here are the prey species that have significant differences in frequency and diet and um, compared to frequency at the sampling site. And interestingly, um, species taken in higher proportion than expected are mostly prey species with migratory tendencies. And the resident um, species in that bunch, spotted toey, is really considered a, you know, from considering the size of sharps and hawks um, is an energetically rewarding prey item that they could encounter on migration. Um, and one caveat that we're exploring with our with this method is that um, the Suave method really only detects prey species in a sample, not the number of individuals. So while, for example, hermit thrush and um, fox sparrow are a really significant portion of migrant sharp shin hawk diet, um, we're detecting it in less frequency than we would expect, but that could be due to um, not detecting multiple individuals um, in the diet of these individuals, uh, individual hawks. So next steps, um, we really wanna see if migration time is correlated over long-term data sets. Um, so we can investigate this concept of prey tracking. So are sharp chin hawks timing their migration with these preferred prey items that are also migrating um, along similar routes? And so for that, we're um, um, collaborating with um, some folks at National Audubon Bond Society to um, um, set that up. So in conclusion, um, migration diet is a missing puzzle piece in the life histories of raptors around the world. And that may be surprising to some folks considering that we know a lot about what raptors are eating, um, but most of that information and knowledge is gathered on the breeding grounds when birds are tied to known locations. We could use standard um, observation techniques. Um, we could use spotting scopes. We could use um, remote sensing cameras, things like that. But on migration, these birds are on the move and we don't really know any um, aspects or we know very limited aspects about their foraging ecology, um, what makes their migration successful, what powers it. And so with this research, we're really showing that swabbing talons and beaks is an efficient tool to study raptor migration diet using a really modern genetic te uh, technique, which is DNA metabarcoding. Um, using this method, we were able to detect differential prey size selection between um, males and females on migration. Um, we were able to detect that um, songbird, eruptive songbird migrations actually influence raptor diet on migration. And also just find support that migrant avian prey are a critical resource for these birds. So this kind of ties back into conservation of um, songbirds and how, you know, declining um, neotropical migrants may influence um, raptor survival on migration. And the success of this method has really broad implications. So, you know, using this method and actually getting dietary data, we could look at co-evolutionary uh, migration research. Um, so like um, understanding um, any um, relationship between um, how raptors might be influencing um, songbird behavior on migration or vice versa. And this really has conservation implications in that uh, full life cycle research is really important. We need to know what these raptors are consuming throughout their annual cycle. And this is when, when you consider that these migratory birds spend about a third of their annual cycle on migration, it's really important to find that missing puzzle piece. And also like just the fact that we're able to describe diet without direct observations and has um, really large impacts because we're actually applying this method outside of migration as well. Um, you know, linking diet to contaminant exposure in red to hawks on farms. And we'll also be launching a new um, um, diet study using this method, um, working to describe American kestrel diet during winter. Um, so we can understand more about their, um, compare their breeding season diet to their winter diet. And with that, I just wanna thank you all for listening. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Um, hopefully I'm okay. Um, but I, um, before I end, I just want to thank all my co-authors and collaborators for making this research possible. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Awesome, Brian. Uh, great talk. Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I have one in the chat so far. Regarding male-female diet, is there much more dimorphism in sharp shin than Merlin? What uh, was that species difference seen in data? 
Um, sorry, it cut out a, sec uh, a second on my end. Could you repeat the question? Or? Sure, no problem. Uh, regarding male female diet, is there much more dimorphism in sharp shin than Merlin? Was that species difference seen in data? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. Um, yeah, there is um, a difference between the two species. So the degree of uh, um, dimorphism is a lot more exaggerated in sharp shin hawks um, compared to Merlin's. And that's actually something we are hoping to look at in the future with um, a little bit of uh, modeling um, to actually look and see like if that degree of dimorphism actually influences um, what we're seeing in the diet data. So um, really good question and something we're also curious about trying to quantify that difference. Awesome, yeah, good question, Jan. Uh, another question from uh, Dave Kisner. How is the eDNA database for small mammal and insect prey items? That's also a good question and one that um, we're currently looking into right now um, um, based on the fact that we're expanding this method to look at different, um, spe more generalist species. Um, I'm not too sure, um, I can't give you an exact, we're kind of exploring primers to see, um, barcode primers to see what would give us good resolution for mammals and insects. Um, I'm sure um, there are other, if there are other um, DNA uh, metabarcoding experts that study inverts or mammals, they could probably give a, a better answer than that. But that's definitely a question on my mind right now. Yeah, another good question. And with another question in the chat uh, from Andy, do you think migration patterns, e.g. timing pathways, will be different for raptors, non-raptor species in the future as a result of climate change? That's also a really good question. And I would say, I mean, just based on you know past studies going on, there is already a change being seen and a lot of concern with, um, especially migratory species that rely on resources um, at stopover sites at um, you know arriving to their breeding grounds um, at the right time that resources are becoming available. So definitely um, some concerns with climate change and migratory um, habits for birds. Um, we are seeing some signal, um, it's unpublished analyses right now, but there are some changes going on in California with the uh, timing of sharp shin hawks and Cooper's hawks as well. So um, definitely people looking into that to better describe that. So really good question. Yeah, for sure. Another good question from Angela Woodside. Are other hawk watch sites beyond um, Golden Gate uh, Raptor Organization implementing prey DNA swabbing into their trapping data collection? Another really good question. Um, as far as I know, there are some, I think Hawk Mountain is exploring um, as of recently um, swabbing cloacas to describe diet. And I think they present, I just saw a presentation at the Raptor Research Conference on that. Um, but as far as beak and talon swabbing, I know GGRO is considering um, doing it and um, you know looking at different species using the method, seeing that it works. And it's also like a really good sample to archive. So we're raptor migration monitoring stations are always um, archiving um, breast feathers from every bird they ban for future genetic or um, toxin analysis. Um, so this could be a really good way to you know collect a swab sample, store it in the freezer for future diet studies. Yeah, great. All good questions. Um, we actually have a couple more minutes, so if anyone else has any other questions, throw them in the chat. Um, I'll give them a few more, a few more seconds to type them out. Um, I guess one real quick question I have: How come uh, Cooper's hawks weren't included in your in the in the species analysis? Um, sorry, could you repeat that? How come uh, you didn't include Cooper's hawks? Oh, <laughs> that's a really good question too. Um, mostly because um, so we didn't have the capacity to um, get that much sampling equipment. And we really wanted to focus on Merlins and Sharps and Hawks as like, you know, they're Cooper socks are also bird specialists, but they're also opportunistic. Um, they'll, they have a much broader diet. And our question was really on, um, is really driven on looking at the hypothesis of Sharps and Hawks following uh, migrant songbirds. And then we opportunistically swabbed. Merlins and Cooper's hawks are actually one of the species that um, I think GGRO has um, their eyes on for future studies. Gotcha. Really, really good question. Great, thank you. Um, well, that is awesome. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, I think we're gonna yeah, push, push ahead. Oh, do you have a question? Suzanne? Um, 
Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Ryan. Appreciate that. And we're gonna we're gonna push forward. So our next presenter is uh, Katie Drexedge. Um, she worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for six years as a wildlife biologist. She also worked at the Slow County Public Works Environmental Division for 12 years as an environmental resource specialist, then promoted to principal environmental specialist. She works currently works for the state parks as a senior environmental scientist for just over a year, managing the natural resources program. Um, and her talk is an overview of state parks, slow post districts, natural resources program. Uh, Katie, if you're on uh, on our uh, call, go ahead and share your screen and uh, welcome. Great, thank you. Sorry, I'm just gonna, let's see if I can get this going. All right, can everybody see that PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, great. great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, like Sean said, I've been with State Parks now for uh, a little over a year. Uh, I'm the senior environmental scientist and um, I'm in charge of the natural resources program here at Slow Coast District. So um, you'll hear California State Parks referred to as California State Parks or the Department of uh, Parks and Recreation. It's interchangeable. And here at San Luis Obispo Coast District, um, I'm just here to talk to you guys today about um, who we are, what we do, and um, just throw it out there in case people are looking for future state jobs with parks. Um, kind of show you guys how to get your foot in the door and um, some of the experiences we have here at Slow Coast. So like uh, several good government entities, we like to refer back to our mission statement and policies uh, when people fo when folks are asking what, what it is we do and why. And so tying it back to California State Parks mission, uh, the mission of the state parks is to provide for the health, inspiration, education of California. Uh, basically, we're, we're here to conserve, protect um, the environment for the educational and recreational benefits of the, you know, the whole world, basically. Um, and it really provides a lot of unique opportunities. We get to work with um, our, our cultural folks, our historical folks, and um, of course, biological resources. And we all work together. We have a whole interpretive uh, program. They help do outreach and education, um, state parks. They have their own YouTube channel. So it's a really exciting uh, group of folks to work with. Uh, National Resources Program, um, we are land managers and we are tasked with um, managing habitat um, through a wide variety of, of ways to conserve and correct. Um, we basically correct up an ongoing maintenance monitoring. Um, some of that involves uh, exotic species control, like the jabata grass you see here pictured to the left of the screen or to the right. Um, and we have a, we do watershed and wetland management. We used a prescribed fire to do some uh, weed abatement and um, corrective actions and uh, to improve forestry health. And we, um, all in all, we get to manage and preserve parklands in a way that resembles, we try to get them back to the, the landscape uh, of pre-settlement California. Um, a lot of the properties we inherit um, had a lot of ag activities on them and come with a lot of invasives or non-natives. So we work with um, our entire staff to correct those, get them back to native habitat. Some of our guiding policies, um, it's all from our department operations manual or the DOM, and it's basically policy documents for the whole state park system. Uh, one chapter, chapter 300, covers everything and anything, all natural resources, several policies, a uh, whole wide variety of guidance, um, and some of those topics are listed here. Um, there's several more. And for San Luis Obispo Coast, uh, our resource program, we're focused, we're broken up into three focus programs at this point. Uh, we've got our Western Snowy Plover program, we've got our forestry program, and we have a restoration program that focuses on um, restoration programs and weed abatement throughout our whole district. And our current staff, uh, we've got me, the senior environmental scientist, and I've got um, a team of eight full-time and or part-time environmental scientists below me, um, and they help manage our seasonal staff. I'll show an org chart next. Um, we've got a few vacancies coming up, so that was another reason I wanted to be able to uh, put this out there for folks. Um, we've got some vacancies coming up that are good for students who may still are, maybe are still um, balancing school uh, work um, and are looking for some part-time work. So I'll show the org chart next. So like I said, uh, senior environmental scientist, that's me at the top and I've got teams of uh, environmental scientists below that running our three major programs. Uh, we've got kind of our forestry program to the left and then to the right, we've got 
are restoration and Western Snowy Plover programs. And we've got environmental services interns. Um, that's one of the seasonal positions we've got here. And then the other one uh, in red, there are the, the forestry aides. And San Luis Obispo Coast District, we stretch from Montana de Oro up to and beyond Piedras Blancas. So we've got some properties in the Irish Hills. We've got Montana de Oro. Uh, we've got Morro Bay State Park. We've got Estero Bluffs when you start moving up north, north of Cayucas there. Um, we've got Harmony Headlands, which is between Cayucas and Harmony. And you go further up past Cambria, we've got uh, more property up there. Um, and then we've got basically the Hearst and Simeon State Park is, is huge and it stretches uh, the whole coastline, big chunk of that coastline up there and includes um, the historical state monument, also known as Coast Castle. And I don't have it here. I think it's over 20, over 40 miles of coastline. And I wanna say over tw about 20,000 acres. So it's a lot of property, a lot of opportunity for us to do um, long-term conservation, monitoring and management of these properties. It's really, really exciting to be a part of that. And some examples of what we do, um, we do species monitoring and management um, for listed or sensitive species. We've got monarchs, plovers, um, some other uh, species that are um, like black oyster catchers, they're associated with uh, the intertidal um, habitat type, which is potentially at risk for sea level rise. Uh, um, so that's something we're keeping an eye on. Uh, we work closely with Audubon. And we also conduct habitat restoration activities, uh, wetland re and riparian restoration. Uh, we do invasive spe species management, uh, we conduct EDRR, so early detection and rapid response. Um, so for those uh, weedy species that are um, high on you know, the alert list, we keep an eye out on those and work with uh, local folks to control those on our properties. Um, and, and my own uh, staff too, they actually um, apply herbicide too under the county's ag permit. And we've got uh, forestry and fuels management, as I've mentioned, and we also have opportunities uh, potentially uh, through uh, cannabis watershed protection prop 64. Um, we haven't explored too much into that yet, um, but that's something on the horizon as well. Um, and that's becoming something bigger in all of state parks throughout the state. And with that, I'll go briefly into each of those three programs I mentioned. Uh, right now, we've um, our forestry program has just kicked off their burning season this week. Um, so we use prescribed fire uh, to restore native plant and wildlife habitats, and we uh, and to reduce chances of large destructive wildfires. So it's a matter of uh, protecting the public and facilities, but also protecting the forested environments themselves. Um, if there's too much fuel, then the uh, natural environment around the area that has a wildfire, if it's a huge, large destructive wildfire, that um, those native communities may not bounce back as they would have. Um, so after years of fire suppression, many, of Cal many areas of California um, that had experienced fire regularly for thousands of years had not burned for decades. So now, you know, we're seeing these destructive wildfires and um, state parks is really, as a result of the governor uh, funding wildfire, um, basically prevention methods, uh, state parks is really staffing up their forestry programs and working with folks like Cal Fire um, and local fire departments to uh, reduce um, basically fuels on state parks property. So we've got, there's some history here, but um, basically in addition to creating higher fuel loads in some areas, fire suppression activities during the last century have altered many native plant and animal communities. So uh, state parks, we had our first prescribed fire in Montana, Oro in 1973. And actually my group is out there burning again right now. And they're um, just, they're really just getting rid of dead and dying trees in these uh, forests we've got the non-native eucalyptus forest in Montana de Oro, but we also have a native uh, Monterey pine forest up in San Simeon. Um, we do have some native bishop pines. Um, so we're, we're doing what we can um, with just cleaning up the, the duff and the branches and the dead and dying trees right now. Um, eventually we'll, we'll work through the permitting process to um, build on that and really take larger trees um, and, and figure out how to manage the landscape um, in a way that we can uh, you know, if they're like in the case of Montana de Oro where there's non-native eucalyptus trees, we'll figure out how to balance restoration activities with um, maybe some level of non-native tree removal. Um, 
but in a manner that we don't lose habitat in the meantime and we keep um, the forest environment for all the, the nature that is relying on it at this point. You know, even though they are non-native, we've still got um, several species of birds nesting them and you have um, some wildlife, you know, still moving and using these corridors. So we have to be mindful of that as well. Our Western Snowy Plover program, uh, we've got a few, of course, tying it back to policy. I listed the policies here and I'm under uh, forestry as well, but our plover uh, management program for those recovery goals for this species and as identified by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, so the whole state um, conducts protective uh, measures or on their um, properties for Western Snowy Plovers. Um, Oceano has a plover program as well. Um, Santa Cruz, I mean, throughout the whole coast, any state parks, um, they're all dialed into the, the plover program. Um, we have dedicated funding for this program. Not a lot, we're working on getting more, um, but it's something that, you know, the state works closely with US Fish and Wildlife Service to protect and conserve the species and habitat for the species. Um, we need to balance out, you know, make sure that, you know, recreational and educational opportunities and activities aren't uh, resulting in take of the species on our beaches. Oops. And as a part of that, uh, what we do is we, uh, we do have a significant uh, population of breeding plovers and uh, overwintering plovers on our beaches here in uh, Slow Coast. And our staff, my staff, uh, monitors and prepares annual reports for the species. Uh, we, we put up temporary fencing during the nesting breeding season, uh, the nesting season, and then we also remove that fencing at the end of that season. Um, we monitor predator activities, loss of nests, um, and we document human and or dog interactions. We have several sensitive species in, in our coast. Um, as you guys, most of you know, living in San Luis Obispo County, so many sensitive resources, listed resources. We've got our um, endemic Monterey, our endemic Bishop Pine Forest and a, a sensitive Monterey Pine Forest. We've got, I said Moro Bay Scarab Beetle, but it's really a Lososis June Beetle um, that my staff is working on. They're doing some research. Um, they're submitting their information to US Fish and Wildlife Service and CDFW. We've got the Moro Shoulder Band Snail in uh, Moro Bay and Los Osos. Uh, we've got listed uh, plants, including California sea blight, Indian Don Mountain Bomb, Salt Marsh Bird's Beak. Uh, we've got elephant seals, black oyster catchers, monarch butterflies. So a wide variety of really unique and special resources here in Slocos that we get to help manage and monitor. Um, we've got a big population of Townsend's big-eared bats at the Hearst Castle, which is really neat. So that's something else we get to keep our eyes on and monitor and submit data to CNDDB. And then third, third program, uh, restoration, um, we conduct habitat restoration. Uh, we convert land from invasive, you know, if there's invasive species issues, we convert it to native plants. Um, we actually coordinate large scale volunteer events as well to help us with this in areas where, you know, our group of 20 maybe can't you know, do everything on their own. So um, some pictures here show our volunteer group events we'll have. Um, there's, um, I think another, the next one might be scheduled sometime around Earth Day, uh, likely somewhere in Montana de Oro, um, somewhere where we can have enough COVID in mind, you know, keep it outdoors and uh, lots of space for folks to do some, some sort of restoration activities, hands-on restoration activities that really gets the uh, volunteer groups um, really motivated. They really enjoy that. Um, we also have um, a GIS specialist uh, featured in the corner here of this uh, slide, and he helps us. Um, he's got my whole staff uh, dialed in so that they can use their, uh, their phones to track and document anything we're monitoring or measuring, um, even tracking so far as like where we're finding the weeds um, so we can go back and treat them effectively. We've got a greenhouse, um, and then here's uh, another kind of picture of one of those volunteer events. Uh, restoring user-created trails. So we're trying to protect native species and their habitats. And by keeping folks on the trails and off of, say, the edge of the bluffs, um, we're reducing those impacts, potential impacts to nesting uh, seabirds who use the cliffs there. This is a picture from Montana de Oro, but, um, you know, anywhere we've got shore nesting, cliff nesting birds all throughout the uh, coastline within our state parks. Uh, here's some examples. We have, uh, we get all the staff together, even though we've gotten kind of, um, it looks like we've got three separate programs. We actually get together and do um, all staff work days where we can. Um, one of these shows kind of all of us taking down uh, plover fencing because there's over eight miles of fencing we have to take down and, and put up every year. So it's a lot of work. So get a lot of folks out there to help. And then um, we've got a, a native 
uh, pine restoration plot there, the other photo there, we're gonna have a nice big new pine forest uh, across from San Simon Creek Road up there across from the campground. And I realize I probably have just a few minutes left. So just wanted to briefly overview, you know, natural resources positions with California State Parks. We've got uh, full-time, part-time and seasonal positions here. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but if anyone's interested, I'm happy to spend more time chatting about it or send this uh, PowerPoint to anybody that's available. Um, but really, I just wanted to kind of highlight that there's positions that don't necessarily require a degree. There's positions that um, are temporary part-time. Um, some of them do require a degree. Um, so depending upon what level, if you're interested in uh, joining the state parks team, you know, there's a whole wide variety of options here you can um, dip your toes in. Uh, some have benefits, some don't. So I'll quickly go through here because I know I'm short on time. And uh, first step to create an account on Cal Careers, that's for any state uh, position. Um, and then take and pass exams if applicable. Um, some of those positions don't require an exam, um, but some do. Um, and by exam, it's it could be just listing out your uh, educational and career background. Some of them are actually questions and uh, require written uh, submittals, but uh, take a look at these exams if you're interested and, and see what's out there and take any exam that's uh, in a, uh, any, that would tie to any job you're interested in. Um, and you would need a valid California license. Um, and then also reach out to a district senior environmental scientist, uh, myself or any other park you're interested in. And as usual with government, be patient, be persistent. It takes quite a while to get hired and go through the um, hiring process anywhere from, I would say, four to seven months on average now. So be patient, be persistent. <laughs> and with that, I'll just turn it over. Any questions? Thank you, Katie. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, although uh, Jamie sent a nice comment that this program has grown so much since she's worked there in the late 90s, and it's exciting to see all the work that's been done. So great work. Oh, cool. Um, awesome. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, I don't see any questions in the chat, so I think we're gonna gonna move forward. But uh, okay. thanks again. If anyone had, has any questions, actually, I see a hand raised. Let me go there real quick to Heather Howe. Go ahead, Heather. Hi. Um, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to hear the experts that we've heard today. Just so amazing. Um, my uh, uh, remark. Uh, I, two things. I wanted to thank Katie and the state parks for their most beautiful calendar that I just received in the mail. I'm really exceptional photography, high quality. And I want to thank you. I always pass these on to friends and, and including, you know, how to join and so on and so forth. So we thank you. I think it's brilliant keep doing that. And also, um, we used to have a, a wonderful local guy. I'm in Atascadero. I'm a retired educator and an environmental activist, um, formerly on the board with the Santa Lucia Club of uh, a chapter of the Sierra Club, and um, I I really want to get more active with this group. Um, I we used to have a local guy, his name was Lionel Johnson, and he was the oak tree planting man. Anybody remember him? Hmm. He must be getting up there, but this guy for. 30 years voluntarily collected oaks, oak seedlings and had a crew, just volunteers that would go out and plant them everywhere. I live under several oaks and I'm co constantly pulling up the seedlings. And I was just thinking, I've, I've tried saving them and you know donating them or planting them and all this. I don't want any more on my property. So that's why I pull up the seedlings. Maybe I should start saving them and get them to somebody on your team. Should I give you my address or something or uh, just uh, Katie, if you give me your address, if that rings a bell or you could tell me who to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I definitely have some ideas. So maybe Sean, if you could put me in contact with Heather, if that works, maybe email or. I, I, I have, uh, I, yeah, I've been listening all morning, but I, I'm not, you know, on video and I a bit challenged about cross channel, you know, uh, tech. So if you want to give me verbally a, a, an email or something. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. absolutely. There's also a way to uh, message Heather directly on the Zoom chat as well. Oh, uh, I could do that too. Well, yeah, that's okay. So you're going to message me and I'm going to copy off your. So that would be on chat, right? Yes. Yeah. Go to chat. Okay. I see chat. Okay. And I just don't know how to record this. So I'll write it down after you uh, give it to me. Did I miss the uh, Condor uh, presentation yet? Nope. Not yet. That's coming oh. up. Real oh, I'm soon. so glad. I was very disappointed. You know, let me just mention this. I waited for weeks. I had it on my calendar and I waited for weeks for that Zoom open house. And do you know, I could not make it work for me and I missed the whole thing. I was really disappointed because I've that's on my bucket list to get up there to see it in person. Uh, you know, I'm Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo for 35 years now. And I haven't made it up there and I'm an environmentalist and I'd love to do that, especially post fire. I hope it's still a functioning uh, place, is it? Anybody? Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe someone in the chat can uh, can touch on that, but I think we need question, to- uh, The question was on High Mountain Lookout, is that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, so High Mountain Lookout, it is still functioning, but due to COVID right now, um, access oh. is pretty limited. And well, yeah. so once, once COVID has been sorted out, then, uh, <laughs> no then problem. it'll probably be functioning as normal again. But I uh, figured we that. have a High Mountain discussion after our Condor talks. Yeah. Oh, terrific. And you know well, what? Thank you, uh, that's why... thank you, Katie. We need to sure. push forward, guys. I really okay. appreciate all the great conversations. So thank you so much. We're going to- sure. Sure. Quickly move into our uh, trivia break. I'm going to pass it off to Steph um, if we have time for that. But um, yeah, go ahead. Let's uh, let's keep on moving moving ahead. Thank yeah, you. thanks, Sean. Um, I'd like to announce that Cindy Kimmick was the winner from the last round. Um, she got everything right. So great job, Cindy. Um, I'm going to post to the chat the next um, Zoom trivia um, quiz, which is going to be available for folks. And then I'll announce um, the winner after the um, end of the rest of the presentations. I would also suggest that folks that are interested in trivia stick around after the last presentation um, and the awards because Reese and I will be holding more of a typical quiz bowl style trivia event. Um, and there will be textbooks available for students um, who win our top two prizes um, and t-shirts and gift cards for professionals. So definitely worth sticking around for and giving it a shot. And um, at the very least, it'll be a fun event. Um, so I'm posting that, um, that next quiz document now and uh, good luck everybody. Wonderful, thanks Steph, appreciate it. All right, we're gonna push ahead and uh... Um, our next two talks are about uh, condors, uh, lead, I mean, non-lead ammunition and public outreach. Um, they're, they're similar in scope. Um, so we're gonna have the two presenters give their, give their talks and then questions will be after both presenters so they can um, touch on any questions that are similar and related to their topics. So I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Stake. He is a wildlife biologist with the Tana Wildlife Society but spends much of his time assisting hunters and ranchers um, with the switch to non-lead ammunition. Bay Area native, he first became interested in birds in the sixth grade, a time when the California condor population was at an all-time low. He is proud to now be assisting the many individuals and organizations as they work towards condor recovery in the wild. His talk is targeting non-lead ammunition outreach as the lead threat continues for condors in Central California. Mike, take it away. Thank you, Sean. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation and I'm proud to, uh, to uh, bridge this uh, into the uh, early afternoon of Friday and I hope everyone's having a great week. Uh, hopefully you're seeing a picture of a lovely condor on your screen. Just uh, let me know maybe if, uh, if you're not seeing that and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Ventana Wildlife Society manages the Central California condor population along with Pinnacles National Park. My role is working with hunters and ranchers promoting the use of non-lead ammunition. Kelly Sorensen is our executive director and Joe Burnett 
leads our condor recovery efforts. And we'll see Joe in a minute. Thought I'd overview the condor population. You see the different subpopulations in yellow. Many of us live along that uh, red line that I've added, dividing the central and southern California populations. There is some between the two, but they're still largely disjunct. And I need to add a red star uh, somewhere below that 86 there to show our new San Simeon release site. So new condors are being infused into the population in San Luis Obispo County. And those numbers, 86 and 317, to indicate population sizes, Central California and globally, they're not exact. I'm told that the number has risen to 88 just uh, since uh, I put this slide together uh, recently. We had two chicks just uh, fledge from nests. So these numbers are always changing, but suffice to say that those numbers are far greater than the global low of just 22 birds back in the early 80s. And I should also say that I'm retiring this slide completely very soon. I'm excited to say that there will be another release site off this map in Northwest California at Redwood National Park. The Yurok Tribe and National Park Service will be releasing birds in, uh, in the uh, spring of 2022. And here is my co-author Joe Burnett in an all too familiar pose. Fatalities due to lead poisoning have increased at an alarming rate in the last two plus years in Central California. We had seven in 2019, nine in 2020, and another nine so far here this year. For a population that was nearing 100 birds before the pandemic started, this is a huge impact to the population and one we need to address very quickly. We started releasing birds in 1997. Our first lead death was 2003. As the population has grown since then through releases and also successful breeding in the wild, we've seen these periodic surges in lead poisoning. Uh, 2013 comes to mind, and then here again recently. We expect a few more deaths with a larger population now, but we really need to get back to where we were on the left side of this chart. Lead poisoning comes from the ingestion of spent ammunition, but this is not just a hunting issue. The scene illustrated here can be important as well. Condors frequently forage on the carcasses of small non-game mammals, like ground squirrels. These carcasses are not being collected by the shooter, so they're available for scavengers like condors and eagles. And to add to this, the copper ammunition used for the small calibers used for ground squirrels are in particularly short supply. And so this has had an effect on condors. But while illustrating this, I want to emphasize that ranching is good for condors. Now, this is actually condor habitat. The land is protected from development. There's food sources, there's water resources. So we see hunters and ranchers as the solution in wildlife conservation, not the problem. So we treat them as a solution, but that solution requires non-lead ammunition. And one unique way that we can help hunters and ranchers is by providing free non-lead ammunition. We think they deserve it because they've had to undergo a number of regulations that have changed the way that they do things. Of course, it's required now to use non-lead ammunition for shooting wildlife anywhere in California. You can still buy and sell lead because it is legal at target ranges where wildlife presumably is unaffected. And then since the Safety for All Act, there are regulations now that 
determine how we buy ammunition. Every purchase must be approved by the Department of Justice in the form of what's basically a background check. And this is at the point of sale. The customer provides documentation, a driver's license, answers a few invasive questions. And then once the approval is given, the ammunition is transferred face-to-face -face only through a licensed vendor. This face-to-face -face requirement precludes a lot of the internet shopping because retail shipments are now restricted. So the buyer now must go to their local stores and be satisfied with whatever they find on the shelves. And they're not finding much. Uh, this is not the toilet paper aisle at Kroger's. This is our selection of ammunition. When the pandemic settled in, we saw a wave of new firearm purchases. And this increased demand, along with the ammunition to go with it, cleared the shelves of ammunition pretty much by the end of the summer 2020. Now, ammunition is starting to come back but it's mainly dominated by the lead brands. Some copper brands have been unavailable for more than a year now. So what we have is a law requiring the use of non-lead ammunition, but the mechanism to follow that law is broken. So that's where Ventana Wildlife Society steps in. As a licensed vendor now, we keep a stock of copper ammunition and we give it away free to hunters and ranchers. The question then is, how can we prioritize the distribution of our limited supply to those hunters and ranchers that can have the greatest impact on condor survival? And for that, we let the birds guide us. Technology. Those tags that you see, the 45 there, it's connected to an antenna. These are GPS transmitters that collect increasingly detailed information. We can track where they go, where they spend time on the ground, and we can identify potential feeding areas where they might be exposed to lead. And so we have GIS specialists who review maps of condor distribution. This happens to be a map of land parcels in San Benito County. And we're looking at ground locations and areas that are the darkest blue, there would appear to be areas where condor locations on the ground and possible feeding events are most frequent. So then it becomes an exercise of contacting those landowners and offering them free non-lead ammunition. This is what we mean when we say targeting outreach. It's that short-term process of getting ammunition where it needs to go to have the greatest conservation impact while long-term processes continue to play out. And those long-term processes include increasing market availability of non-lead ammunition and greater compliance with the laws requiring their use. So it's a matter of hitting our spots and clearly we haven't been doing that as well as we could be doing it, but we're getting there. We're eliminating fewer locations of high risk on the map with each month that we review these data. And so the technology is helping us stem the tide of this surge in lead poisoning. In the meantime, we need more condors. And so we are releasing birds. We released uh, a few birds in early November, and we will release three more in December, December uh, 4th. If you mark your calendars, I think that's a Saturday, December 4th. Uh, you can join us live. We're broadcasting it live via Zoom. You can have a chance to watch these birds leave the San Simeon pen and make their way into the wild. You can ask your questions to the biologists and uh, it should be a fun event on December 4th. You can also join our monthly condor chats if you need more condors in your life. And we certainly invite you to become a member of Ventana Wildlife Society. And with that, I will yield my screen to prepare for the next speaker. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mike.
Mike, that was great. Please stick around for after the, last, the next talk because um, if there's any questions that get towards you, you can help answer those. So I'm going to move uh, forward to um, Matthew Parker. Um, uh, he, Matt is from Missoula, Montana. He grew up hunting, fishing, spending every possible moment outdoors. He earned his BS from Humboldt State University in 2014 and his master's in 2020 from Texas State University. He enjoys cooking, hiking, and flying hawks with his wife, who is also a falconer. His talk is Outreach and Communication Strategies for Encouraging Use of Non-Lead Ammunition. So Matt, hopefully you're, uh, you're here. Please take it away, share your screen, and um, take it away. And do, thank you very much. All right, give me one moment. All right, does everybody see my slides? Excellent. So hi, everybody. My name is Matt Parker, and I work as the non-lead outreach specialist for the Institute for Wildlife Studies. While I'm relatively new to California, I'm excited by this opportunity to get more acquainted with my scientific community here in Central California and to discuss a topic of great importance to me, and that is the strategies we use to mitigate the use of lead-based ammunition for any take of wildlife. We just heard a great presentation on some of the non-lead outreach efforts going on, and I'm sure many of you have heard a discussion or presentation on this topic before. So bearing that in mind, I'll do my best to not sound like a broken record, to hopefully pique your curiosity with something new, and at the very least, reaffirm the value of the subject at hand. I wanna give a brief overview once again of the crux of the issue. Lead has a wide range of utility, and it's still today the main material used to manufacture ammunition. Unfortunately, lead is also a toxic heavy metal. It serves no known biological function, and the toxic effects of lead are actually compounded by the fact that lead bullets will fragment when they travel at high velocities and make contact with a solid object like an animal. In situations where that animal is left behind on the landscape or its remains in the form of a gut pile are left behind, those lead fragments then become potential pathways of exposure to endanger scavenging wildlife with lead poisoning. But this is a really solvable problem. And the solution is to use non-lead ammunition whenever take of an animal is required. We are very fortunate that in 2021, there is a considerable amount of variety of non-lead ammunition available. This allows hunters and ranchers more options than has ever been available before. However, often when we conduct outreach, many individuals are not aware of the different types of non-lead bullets offered. We personally study and test a variety of non-lead and lead-based options so that we can describe our experiences with fellow hunters. We discuss the attributes of different bullet types and can make suggestions or point hunters and shooters in the direction of a bullet that may fit their needs. For example, we can describe the weight retention effects of a solid copper bullet for a center fire hunting rifle. And we can juxtapose this with the fragmenting properties of a segmenting or fragmenting hunting bullet. These are supposed to mimic some of the properties of lead where the front of the bullet will actually peel away, creating additional wound channels. There are also bullet types called frangible rounds, which are great for uh, harvesting or dispatching animals you do not desire to consume. They're incredibly accurate and have similar properties to lead in their performance. Um, but many hunters aren't aware of the, or ranchers are not aware of these options available. Similarly, with rimfire, which is corresponding to small caliber rifles like 22s, as well as with shotguns, there's a variety of metal materials available classified as non-lead that can fit the shooter's needs. Even though I'm new to California, it's not lost on me that a law is in place requiring the use of non-lead ammunition for take. However, as Mike mentioned in the previous study, scavengers are still presenting with high levels of lead concentrations in their systems and poisonings are occurring despite that legislation in place. So this is once again, a good reason for non-lead outreach. When we conduct outreach, we try to describe the biology and the ballistics and the performance of these bullets and describe it in a way members of the general public can understand. We try to help individuals understand how their bullets perform and we, once again, provide information about the varieties of options available. A lot of California hunters like myself can hunt out of state, and some hunters and individuals are hesitant to listen to any information that can be regarded as interference with their rights. Hunters want to know that their tool works. Lead has been a tried and tested tool that works and has worked for hundreds of years. But non-lead ammunition works too, and that's the central to what we try to highlight when we're conducting non-lead outreach. 
it's not what you say, it's what they hear. A phrase that really resonated with me when I first heard it in my tenure of this position, and it's something I continue to try to remind myself whenever I conduct outreach, because this is a sensitive topic, subject for many people. We use positive and apolitical messaging that we tailor towards the target audience, whether we're talking to ranchers or hunters, and we really try to build our credibility within these communities by having the information come from hunters and biologists, and by the variety and amount of non-lead and as well as lead-based ammunition that we test ourselves. And as Mike mentioned, and I continue to mention whenever I do outreach, we view hunters and ranchers as the solution and emphasize this whenever we conduct outreach. So we are not a licensed FFL. We cannot distribute ammunition like Mike can at Ventana, but we do outreach in different ways. We give presentations to rod and gun clubs and conservation groups, um, basically any time, type of group that may have a ranching or hunting based community. If given the opportunity, we'll conduct a shooting demonstration, which is a very effective form of outreach. It's actually the way I'll be ending my presentation with a video that highlights this type of outreach. We'll hold a booth at banquets and exposés where we can interface with ranchers and hunters. We write articles to local newsletters and newspapers and journals with a hunting-based or ranching-based audience. And we're active on several social media platforms where we post technical posts about the benefits of non-lead ammunition. Once again, utilizing that positive messaging. So I hope this works. Um, I apologize if sounds a little wonky, but what you're gonna see now is a video illustrating our most effective form of outreach, which is a shooting demonstration. What we do is we use recycled water to capture bullets. And this is an opportunity to compare a lead bullet and a non-lead bullet next to each other. We often do these with designated ranges owned by rod and gun clubs where we can have hunters even shoot the ammunition types themselves. So what I'll be doing now is conducting the shooting demonstration. I'll be shooting a high caliber hunting rifle, 30 out six, and I'll be shooting a lead bullet and a non-lead bullet into the water barrels that we've set up downrange. I'll be shooting the non or the lead core bullet into the right barrel. I'll be shooting the non-lead bullet into the left barrel. At this moment, I'm going to call range hot. The range is clear downrange. Everyone behind me will put on ears and eye protection. I'll fire the two shots. We'll call range cold. We'll go see the results. Range is hot. To maximize the effectiveness of this type of outreach, we'll always shoot uh, common factory loads you can pick up at your average sporting goods store. Um, and we try to keep the variables the same. So for instance, the, the two types of ammunition I'm shooting in this example are both 150 grains, grains being the unit of measurement for bullets, and so that the only material or difference in the variables between these two bullets is the material. Range cold. So we shot our barrels. I'm standing behind the non-lead barrel. We're gonna take a look and see what happened. Just looking at it, I see right away that we captured the non-lead bullet. And as a result, what you see here is a fully expanded non-lead copper bullet. In contrast, let's come over now and take a look at the barrel with all the with the lead bullet. I see that there's still quite a bit of lead fragments. This jug captured the jacket of the lead core bullet. So we're going to pour that out. That's that non-lead there. And so that is the non-lead or the lead core bullet shot. You can see a nice smoothing um, surface of the, the front of that bullet. But we're going to take these jugs out really quick here, and you're going to see where the rest of that bullet went. And now what you're seeing is the results of the fragmentation resulting from a lead core bullet. And as you see, you see all these fragments at the bottom of the barrel are lead. And so both bullets that I shot for this example were 150 grains. The lead core bullet ended up losing 28% of its weight in the form of those fragments at the bottom. 
So this form of outreach is great for not only highlighting the expansion and benefits of a non-lead bullet, but also the fragmentation of a non-lead bullet. If you'd like to know more, huntingwithnonlead.org as well as the non-lead partnership website are great examples and have a lot of good information. The non-lead partnership is co-founded with the Institute for Wildlife Studies, the Paragon Fund, and the Oregon Zoo. And what this partnership is about is using uniform messaging and encouraging the transition to non-lead ammunition through a voluntary switch and encouraging incentives and other means to promote non-lead ammunition use. With that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I think Mike and I are gonna take questions together. Matt, that was fascinating. Thank you, very good talk. Um, and if there's any questions, um, please put them in the chat or raise your hand. We have a minute or two available, so um, not too much time. But um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to send them our way. That was um, both, uh, both, both talks were wonderful. Thank you both. Very great information and um, really appreciate it. Uh, I see a hand raised. Let's do a real quick question. Go ahead, Heather. Do you have a quick question? Um, I just wanted to ask Matt if he has, um, I live in uh, the North County, San Luis Obispo, uh, and we have a lot of hunters and ranchers out here, and they're all totally gung-ho. And um, I wonder if he's thought or of offering um, workshops of this type through the farm supply company and other trusted highly trafficked um, retail venues that that farmers, ranchers, and even hunters um, go to because it's a, a good hub in the neighborhood. It's uh, strongly supported. They have the Farm Supply Company of San Luis Obispo. I don't know if they go further south. I think they may, but it's a cooperative of ranchers, farmers, landowners and definitely the movers and shakers of the landed uh leaders of our county and Thank they've been question, wonderful yeah. but I, I just wanted to recommend that might be a different venue if you haven't tried that thank you Heather. Uh, okay matt i haven't personally reached out to them i mean we reach out to tons of groups. That's a great example. I actually wrote it down, Heather, so thank you. And I, I plan to follow up. Uh, we are kind of at the mercy of whoever has either the ability to host us um, or a designated range where we can perform that demonstration. But we it's not for lack of trying. We try to do outreach. I, I do outreach across the state. So in fact, I'll be heading north tomorrow to do one of those demonstrations in person. Um, but I will happily follow up, Heather. And I thank you for that. Uh, sure. That resource. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, I think we're gonna. Uh, any other questions? Please uh, re you can reply in the chat, and um, we're gonna keep moving forward. So thank you both again. And um, our next uh, presenter is uh, Dave Clendenden. He is a uh, Dave graduated from Cal Poly in 1981 with a degree in natural resources management and a concentration in wildlife biology. He worked for 15 years as a biologist on the California Condor Recovery Program. He then managed Wind Wolves Preserve and served as an organizational ecologist with the Wildlands Conservancy for 17 years. For the past seven years, Dave has worked as a technician in the biology department at Cal Poly and as a preserve manager for Morro Coast Audubon Society at Sweet Springs National Preserve or Nature Preserve. Thank you. Um, his talk is history and status of gray wolves, Canis lupus in California. So Dave, with that, take it away as our last presenter of the symposium. Hold on here. Oops. <laughs> okay. Have you got it now? Yep, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, um, good afternoon. Um, 
I'm going to talk about the status and history of wolves in California, and it's an exciting time right now in California for wolves. Um, and um, I think it's safe to say that wolves are um, probably the most controversial and polarizing wildlife species in North America, if not the planet. Um, wolves are, we know now, incredibly important to their ecosystem and the function of their ecosystem and the health of it. Um, and it is an incredibly polarizing figure. There's a lot of people in this, uh, in our society that love wolves. And there are a lot of people that really would rather wolves were not on the, on the landscape. And there's really two groups that uh, feel that way. Uh, the first group is hunters. They feel um, wolves are competition for their game. And so they'd rather not have wolves out there. And the other group largely is livestock producers. And uh, livestock producers have a cogent argument. Um, a, a cow or a sheep is a very valuable animal uh, worth hundreds of dollars, depending on the market, sometimes thousands of dollars. And so if you're out there making a fairly marginal living on, on livestock and wolves are taking uh, basically money right out of your pocket. So that's a conflict that uh, exists and that's not going to go away as wolves are on the landscape in private and public land and they do take uh, private livestock. And as in all uh, sort of passionate discussions in our society, misinformation is a real issue for wolves in our discussion. Uh, this is actually a, 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 bull, a billboard that was uh, next to highways in Washington state. Uh, what's on, who's next on their menu. And uh, the animals on the left certainly are uh, on the menu. Uh, however, uh, there's a lot of hysteria about the safety of people. Wolves are, are really very timid around people. They will uh, most often uh, go the other way if they have a choice with people. Uh, in the 21st century, there's only been two instances of, of wolf attacks resulting in the death of people. And one of those uh, involved uh, animals that were uh, badly habituated. So uh, wolves are really not a threat to people. And wolves are uh, one of those animals that people are incredibly fascinated by them. They're iconic symbols of wilderness. Um, and uh, people that love wolves really love wolves. And why are we so fascinated? And I think one of the reasons is that they can be so reflective of human traits. You know, they live in cooperative social groups that we call packs. They're family oriented. The packs are a social group led by a dominant male and female, the alpha pair, which is much like our families. They form a strong bond and they mate for life. And they're extremely loyal to their social group. So these are all uh, things that people value greatly. And of course, uh, they're ancestors to all domestic dogs. Um, so all the dog breeds we have, and I'm sure out there in this group, there are an awful lot of dog lovers. Um, so all of our domestic dogs were essentially bred originally from wolves. And it boggles my mind still that uh, Chihuahua came from a wolf. Um, but I've known a few Chihuahuas that thought they were as big as wolves. Um, and Lastly, the domestication of the wolf, they were probably the first animals that were domesticated by people. And that happened, we think, between 11 and 16,000 years ago, which means that happened during the time that hunter-gatherers. So if you think about that, uh, wolves and people have had a very long, deep relationship down through time. Uh, this is an interesting graphic from an old 1959 textbook, the, the sort of the original home range uh, or the range of wolves in North America. So you see they, they covered most of the continent. It's kind of hard to, to zero in on the range of wolves in California. You, you see different maps that have very different uh, areas um, and archeological evidence has uh, added more areas than was uh, passed down through records. Um, but uh, wolves probably existed through the San Joaquin Valley uh, the coast ranges and the Sierra and the deserts. Through uh, 
the 1800s and into the early 1900s, uh, basically in California and most of the rest of the lower 48 states, wolves were eradicated by people. Um, they were uh, uh, persecuted, uh, predators were considered bad in those years um, and predators were killed. And it was actually a, a government sanctioned program. Um, the US um, Bio Geological Survey was enlisted uh, in uh, the extermination effort. And uh, so it was a government sanctioned uh, program. And it was actually sort of got off the ground by our great conservationist president, Teddy Roosevelt, who uh, was, a, was also a, a great hunter. And he referred to wolves as the beast of waste and desolation. So by 1924 in California, the last wolf was killed in the San Bernardino area, which may have also been a, a Mexican gray wolf. Uh, and then there was a wolf also killed in Lassen County in the, in the late 20s, so or in the early 20s. So those were the last wolves in California. By the 1930s, wolves in the lower 48 states were restricted to only this small area around the western part of the Great Lakes. And probably the reason they were allowed to persist here is because uh, this is a, a pretty densely forested area for the most parts, and they don't tend to have those conflicts with livestock. And so that population has persisted um, and was the only area in the lower 48s from the 19. Uh, 30s to the 80s that had uh, gray wolves. It wasn't until uh, the middle of the 1900s, really, that uh, we began to realize the importance of wolves. Uh, wolves are both apex predators and a keystone species. And Aldo Leopold um, sort of provided the germ for the evolution of our thought on predators and the importance when he wrote an essay called Thinking Like a Mountain. And so we now understand that wolves are a very positive force for ec ecosystem health. So uh, it's important to notice or realize that all of the wolves that are now in California and immigrating into California, there has not been a reintroduction program, but all the California wolves are a direct result of the reintroductions that occurred in the Rocky Mountains in the 1990s. Those reintroductions started in uh, uh, January 1995 uh, in Yellowstone and in central Idaho. So this is the moment that wolves came back into Yellowstone, January 12th in 1995. And that uh, event was the result of a process that took 20 years of heated discussion in our society about whether we should put wolves back out on the landscape. So it took 20 years for us to decide that that was a good thing to do. Once wolves were reintroduced, it was a tremendous success. This is a graph of the Northern Rocky Mountain population. Um, you see in 1995, those initial reintroductions. And in 18 years from those few animals, um, there were over 1,700 wolves on the landscape in the Rocky Mountains. So tremendously successful reintroduction. And Wolves have recolonized uh, their, their former range really through dispersal, natural dispersal. Uh, animals leave their packs uh, on the average of about three years of age when they have a, a, an urge to breed and they're prevented from breeding by the alpha uh, pair and the structure, the social structure of their packs. Those, so they strike out on these dispersal trips. And this is a wolf that famously showed up in the Kaibab Plateau in 2000, 2014, uh, was determined to be a member of a pack from Wyoming through DNA analysis. And in about 2008, 2009, the Rocky Mountain wolves uh, had dispersed, starting to disperse into Oregon. And on the bottom here, you'll see uh, OR7, this was his range. And OR7 uh, became the first wolf to enter California in December of 2011 in 87 years. He was from the Imnaha pack in Northeastern Oregon. And he left Oregon and his packs range in September of 2011. 
uh, and through his GP GPS collar, we have this uh, wonderful data track, wandered through Oregon, ended up entering California and stayed there for about eight months. And each one of those colors is a different month's time of OR7 wandering through California. Classic uh, wandering, looking for other wolves, looking for a territory. Eventually he returned to Oregon and became uh, the alpha of the rogue pack, the alpha male, and lived his life there uh, as, as the alpha in the Klamath Falls area. And by 2020, this was the picture of wolves in Oregon, population growing. And it's important also to realize that all the documented wolves that have colonized California have come from Oregon wolves. So that, that sort of linear dispersal of the population from the Rocky Mountains through Oregon down into California. In August 2015, um, uh, the first contemporary resident wolf pack in California was discovered called the Shasta Pack up in Siskiyou County. And this was an interesting and very short-lived pack. They only existed through 2015. They had one uh, group of puppies. They were all black wolves. Um, and the alpha pair were siblings from the Imnaha pack. And so that maybe that that was one of the reasons that pack didn't persist. It's an unusual situation. So after November 2015, uh, the pack was not ever detected in their home range. Uh, but one yearling wolf was detected in their range in, uh, later in, in 2016 and then in northern Nevada. So it's not known exactly what happened to that pack, but they were very short lived. So currently now in, in 2021 in California, we have three packs. Uh, and this is a, a map of their home ranges. So we have the Lassen pack now, which is a uh, uh, a very long lasting persistent pack. They've been uh, in existence since 2017. They've produced uh, litters of pups each year. Total of 28 pups have been produced by that uh, pack. And much of their home range was burnt over this summer by the Dixie fire. Um, and it's known that the pups at their rendezvous area were burnt over by that fire and at least four of the five pups were documented shortly after the fire. So they survived being burnt over in the Dixie fire. We have the whaleback pack now. Um, and that's up here um, in Siskiyou County. Mount Shasta is right there on the western edge of their range. And uh, that pack uh, consists of uh, Two individuals, one is uh, an adult male that was uh, uh, offspring from the Lassen pack. So the alpha there is dispersed from uh, the Lassen pack. Uh, the female is an unknown origin and uh, they have not bred yet as far as we know. Then there's the Beckworth pack here, south of the Lassen pack range in Plumas County. And uh, two wolves were documented there in February of 2021 and then three were documented in May, so that pack has grown a little bit. As far as we know, they have not uh, uh, bred. Some other interesting wolves, at, at any point in time, there may be uh, individual wandering, dispersing wolves uh, through California. Some of the known wolves, OR25 was born in the Imnaha pack, was the same pack that, uh, that uh, OR7, our first wolf came from. And that wolf visited California four times during uh, 2015 and 16, and then was found dead near Klamath Falls or Fort Klamath, Oregon in 2017. Uh, OR59 uh, uh, entered Modoc County on December 18th and was found shot uh, uh, later that month. And he was documented feeding on the carcass of a calf that uh, died of pneumonia, uh, but he was shot very soon after that. OR54, a uh, female wolf uh, whose GPS collar indicated that she traveled a total of 8,710 miles after dispersing from the road pack. So she was an offspring of OR7 and she died in February 2020 of unknown causes. And then uh, a very wonderful uh, wolf for California, OR39, uh, OR, or 93, I'm sorry. 
Boar 93 has traveled further south than any other wolf in over 100 years. And OR 93, you may remember, passed through San Luis Obispo County in April of 2021. And while he was in the Paso Robles area on April 5th, his GPS collar uh, quit functioning. And it wasn't known for quite some time whether the collar just failed or whether that wolf um, was shot or what happened to him. Uh, but uh, on May 15th, he was picked up on a trail camera uh, in north, southern uh, Kern County, and that's a video that, uh, amazingly enough, was caught on a trail camera that uh, my, my wife Cheryl and I have out uh, near Windwolf's Preserve, where we used to live. And so at the end of the program, I can play that video. Uh, and then OR-93 was later in September, late September, uh, cited three times in northern Ventura County, and not since then. So as far as we know, OR-93 is still out there somewhere in Southern California traveling around. Um, so he's an exciting character. So in California, um, wolves are now protected by the California Endangered Species Act. Uh, Wolves are no longer protected in the lower 48 uh, through the Federal Endangered Species Act, but they are protected in California. And so we don't at this time carry out depredation hunts or kills of wolves like they do in many of the Rocky Mountain states. So two of the folks that uh, work at uh, California DFW that are most involved are Justin Dellinger. And Justin came down and met with us after our video in, in uh, Kern County and looked around. He's a, he's a PhD. Uh, a large carnivore specialist does a lot of research on mountain lions and he's doing research on the wolves in, in uh, California. And then Kent Loudon is the CSW's uh, wolf specialist and he is the lead in California for uh, all the wolf uh, 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 monitoring and public outreach. He spends a tremendous amount of his time trying to build trust and establish relationships with livestock producers in the community and has been fairly successful at that, uh, that he feels that's one of his most important roles. And so Canada's out there every day uh, working for wolves. And uh, we, we now have a lot of information on how wolves can coexist with livestock, uh, the range riders program. And uh, so there are a lot of efforts to uh, manage livestock in a way that prevents or minimizes wolf uh, predation. So in California, again, we have three packs. Um, the population is slowly growing. It's, it's, it's a difficult uh, trend uh, in their population because uh, there will be conflicts with livestock. In, in California, the density of, of uh, natural prey, large ungulates is much less than most of the Rocky Mountain areas. So there will be conflicts continuing with livestock producers and wolves, but we have a very hopeful situation and three packs going and the population slowing building. So um, that's, that's pretty much it for that. Um, so I just wanna quickly play our video of OR93 in uh, May, um, coming to uh, water troughs. So we have our trail camera on. So it was just a brief visit, but it was enough to see that his GPS collar was the same that uh, matched uh, or 93 style of collar. And uh, then later it was determined that the, the animal in Northern Ventura County had that purple collar that he does. So we're pretty certain that that's who it is. So um, that's all I have. And uh, thank you very much. Wonderful, Dave. Thank you so much for that great talk. And if anyone has any questions for David, please throw them in the chat or you can raise your hand. We have a couple of minutes for, for questions. So um, yeah, fire away if you have any.
a uh, quick question from Chad. Was that video from Windwolves, the preserve? It was adjacent to Windwolves, very near. But that wolf, um, from his track where he disappeared in San Luis Obispo County, where it ended up, it almost certainly traveled across Windwolves. And rangers at Windwolves actually had an observation of an animal that they thought was a wolf, um, although the timing wasn't great. It was just the day after Or 93 disappeared in San Luis Obispo. But it almost certainly did cross through uh, Windwolves. Right. A uh, quick question from Michaela. Any news on how the Dixon fire has impacted the Lassen pack? Uh, they've had uh, quite a few observations of the pack. As I said, the, uh, at least four of the five pups from this year made it through uh, the fire, and the fire burnt right over the rendezvous area where the pups were, so they managed to uh, escape the flames, at least four or five of them. And the pack has still been out there. So, um, in fact, they were documented uh, after the fire, um, there were a lot of livestock killed and they were feeding on the carcasses of, of cattle killed in the fire for quite a while after the fire. But uh, most of the pack apparently made it through and uh, are still there. And the fire burned through a, a, a lot of their home range, but not all. Interesting. Uh, question from Kim. If a wolf is seen in California, how do we report it? Uh, you can go to the, uh, the California DFW has a, a wolf page on their website. And you can go there and all the contact information is on that site. Uh, there's actually a button you can, you can push to, uh, to report wolf sightings. Great. Um, where in Ventura County was OR93 observed? Uh, it's Northern Ventura County. The uh, DFW wants to keep the, the, the sort of the close locality uh, uh, confidential, uh, but it's in, in, in Northern Ventura County. Gotcha. And maybe one last quick, quick question. What are your thoughts on sharing info on detection of wolves with the public? I think I, whether we like it or not, it happens automatically. The, the, the DFW has an agreement with uh, all the counties and the livestock or the farm bureaus. Um, so each time uh, a wolf enters a county, uh, like OR93 did through that string of counties that he traveled through, the DFW will, will contact that county, the, the Ag Commissioner in that county, and report wolf sightings. So um, I think it's good that, that awareness of wolves wherever they are, um, uh, so that you know people that would protect wolves and know that they're out there are aware of it. Um, and it's just good education to know that wolves are traveling through California, uh, dispersing and we have wolves. Yep, we sure do. And uh, I guess one more just came through. Any concerns of someone hurting OR93? That should be our last question for David. Uh, well, of course, that's a con constant concern when his, when yeah. his collar uh, ceased functioning. Uh, it was a big question whether he uh, was shot and the collar destroyed or whether the collar just went out, off the air. And so, um, especially an animal that's traveled that far. He crossed uh, an incredible array of large freeways. He crossed 80, 99, 5, 101, 395. Um, and so he traveled tremendous distance through a lot of, and he traveled across the San Joaquin Valley. So um, certainly uh, something could happen at any point. Um, he's, he's living a dangerous life, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I think we may have one or two more questions in the chat that may filter through. Um, David, if you could maybe uh, address those in the chat, that'd be awesome. We can keep sure. on moving forward. So thank you, David. That was really great. Yeah. I think I'm going to send it over to Jackie. All right. Thank you. Wow. These were some really wonderful presentations. We want to thank everybody for participating. I'm really happy the way this went. We just have a final few things that we want to get through. So please hang on. Um, starting with our winners of our bio blitz. Uh, award. <laughs> That's super cute. Thank you, Jamie. Sorry, <laughs> I, I chuckled one. when I made it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that one this morning. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so um, starting off with our bio blitz. So we opened up a bio blitz say, for a fall observations about a month ago. And we have some awards that we are going to offer for those. We had five participants in this and thank you so much. We did uh, hear the 
presentation from Thomas Fransom about how important some of the citizens da uh, data collection can be. Um, so I don't know if we have, do we have that slide that has the winners up, Jamie? Yeah, I, I have a couple slides uh, before that on the oh, prizes okay. that we have our, for our BioBlitz winners. Um, so the BioBlitz and trivia has been graciously supported by Okanotter Brewing, uh, Dragonfly Art Glass, and Coyote Brush Studios. Uh, so Okanotter Brewing, um, they have donated a $20 gift card for one of our winners. Uh, Dragonfly Art Glass is donating um, an adorable bird ornament. And with that bird ornament, you are going to get some Point Blue Conservation Science swag. If you can see that in my video, but there's a, there's a hat and a messenger bag. And then Coyote Brush Studios has also donated a $25 gift card and their winter sale is starting today. So if you have any holiday shopping, uh, visit Coyote Brush Studios and with any luck, our winner will have $20 to get started. Thank you, James. Take it away, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> So these were our five observers and uh, we're going to give these awards away to the first the top three. And surprisingly, looks like David Kisner did not place first, which is uh, pretty astounding because he's usually the one that takes us away. <laughs> um, so I have Daniel Boyd is our top observer. And then I don't know who the second person is, is this person on today? If they can claim their award, I would love it. And I don't know if Daniel Boyd is on. I know Dave Kisner is here. I'll give a second. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna let Dave Kisner, since we know he's here. Dave, are you still here? I am here. Okay. <laughs> so I will let you choose first which prize you would like. Again, there's the Oak and Otter Brewing. Uh, $20 gift certificate. There's the Point Blue swag with the adorable Dragonfly art glass there on the left. And the last one is the Coyote Brush Studios gift certificate for $20. I think I'll do Coyote Brush Studios, please. Awesome. Some beautiful artwork there. I strongly encourage everybody to check out that website. Holiday sale starting today. It's fantastic. All right, and we will reach it's out really to- Really quick, da David, oh. I'm pretty sure I have your email address, but maybe send me an email or direct chat or something and I will get you that information. It's horribly complicated. David Kistner at Gmail with a dot <laughs> between the David and Kistner. Perfect, thanks. I'll, I'll get you that information. Okay, hey, wonderful. Well, I wanna move on so we have enough time for our mini quiz bowl. The last uh, award that we are giving out today. Oh, wait, before I do, I forgot about the, the trivia quiz and we'll save that for the, the, the quiz bowl. All right, let's go back to our wildlifer of the year. I don't know how well we were able to keep this secret, but uh, so I will move forward with this. As we are celebrating 50 years of the California Central Coast chapter, we felt it fitting to choose someone that has been so incredibly instrumental in the development structure and success of the chapter to receive our Wildlifer of the Year Award, which is going to go to Michaela Robbins. And I hope it's okay I use that picture, Michaela. I stole it off Facebook. So here is your plaque. And we are giving you $50 at Bay Laurel Garden Center for 50 years of our chapter. And the last thing I'm gonna throw in just because I didn't know what else to do with it. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you the drawing <laughs> that went on to our, uh, <laughs> onto our, our, our logo for this, this event. So real quick, I just wanna give you a little information about what Michaela's done. And then if she wants to add a few words, she can. Uh, Michaela joined the board in 2014 and quickly developed many of the workshops and events that we have, that have built this chapter into what it is today a professional community of scientists, land managers, educators, students, and many others who share the common interest in wildlife conservation. 
Michaela initiated our lecture series and social hours, standalone chapter workshops, and of course, our annual symposium, which quickly outgrew its original location at the Slow County Library. She's also the one responsible for all the wonderful merchandise that we've had throughout the years. She was instrumental in leading our chapter to earn both the Western Section Chapter of the Year and the National Chapter of the Year two years in a row, which to our knowledge hasn't happened before. We owe so much to Michaela for what this chapter has become and we're so honored to have her a part of our wildlife community. She's an outstanding leader, visionary, biologist, friend, and mother. And she's just an all around superhero. So thank you, Michaela. Yay. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, I guess I was completely surprised by this. <laughs> so good job. <laughs> Uh, really excited about the condor artwork <laughs> and yeah thanks everybody for coming and um, supporting our wildlife chapter it means a lot to me and I think it means a lot to our community and that's kind of was my vision early on was build it and they will come and I think as you can see everybody loves to get together especially over beer but um, <laughs> and learn about wildlife <laughs> so Thanks everybody. And uh, yeah, I'm a little bit uh, dumbstruck right now, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I believe Michaela is going to be at Bang the Drum this evening. Is oh, that yes. a go? I, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna be at Bang the Drum probably a little bit early and we'll have um, some of the original t-shirts that we still have for sale at a discount price. So yeah, come drink some beer with us. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Michaela. And real quick, we have our mini quiz bowl and shirts for sale. Those will be on sale for a while, pick one up for the holidays. And um, so let's get this quiz bowl going and then we'll see you all at happy hour. Okay. All right. it, will, it will take me just a minute to change my screen share, but I will be sharing the quiz questions in just a moment. Um, our prizes are donated by Mountaineer Sports, and you get a t-shirt. And, and we're getting books. Yeah, additionally, textbooks uh, provided by Reese and Rick, um, which is extremely generous of them. So our student winners will receive those textbooks, and our professional winners will receive the um, t-shirts and um, gift cards previously discussed. Okay, so folks, good afternoon, California Central Coast Chapter, two-time winner of the Chapter of the Year Award. I think I want to quickly say congratulations to Michaela. That's an amazing thing, so good for you. I remember when M Michaela spoke about uh, rodent genitalia at a meeting I uh, chaired many, many, many months, many, many moons ago. That was one of, that was a great one. So Thanks, uh, thing I want to quickly say is thank you to Jamie for sharing her screen. And everyone out there should be thankful that Jamie is sharing her screen because she's been kicking tail in some of these most recent trivia events. And I assume that she is not allowed to, com to compete today. So let's go on. This is not going to take a long time. So please don't leave. Uh, great prizes. We're only going to be asking six total questions. And here's number one, I hope. Yeah, sorry. before we jump into it, sorry. I just wanted to also say that everybody should be keeping tally on their, um, on a piece of paper, on a notes app, on their phone or a Word document, something. Each question is worth one point. And if you could please um, at the end of the round, share how many points you got correctly, um, that would be great. Just do it in a chat to everybody and I'll keep an eye on that and assign the prizes. Oh, and one other quick thing, Steph, before we do the first trivia question, who won round two? Oh, yes. Thank you so much for reminding me. Um, round two's winner was um, Megan Hendrickson. So great job, Megan. Congratulations, Megan. Okay, so are we ready for question number one? Again, write down your questions. We're going to ask you to score your, your own answers and the prizes are not worth compromising your ethics and they're not worth going to Google and trying to find out the answers before we finish off. So 
with that, Jamie, please move forward on question number one. What is the name of the California condor chick that was shown on the Ventana Wildlife Society webcam threatened by the 2020 Dolan fire? Mike Stake does not get to come uh, answer this question. Everyone else can though. What is the name of the California condor chick that was shown on the Ventana Wildlife Society webcam threatened by the 2020 Dolan fire? Question number two. Badger dens are also known as what? We ask questions fast because we don't want you going to Google or Wikipedia or, or, or. Badger dens are also known as what? Okay, and then moving on quickly to question number three, and Jamie doesn't get to answer this one. The mating system of snowy plovers is unique in that the male raises the chicks after they hatch. What is the name of that mating system? Question four, write these answers down quick. What is the name of the law that, quote, promotes effectual planning, development, maintenance, and coordination of wildlife, fish, and game conservation and rehabilitation on military reservations, unquote? What is the name of that law? I did not write this question, but I think I know who did. And the CDF next last last normal question. This CDFW classification was the state's initial effort in the 1960s to identify and provide additional protection to those animals that were rare or faced possible extinction. It wasn't our last question. Here's our last our last normal question. <clears throat> Many species of lizards release their tail when they want to escape a predator. What is the term for that action? Lizards releasing their tail to escape predate a predator. So then we're going to ask a tiebreaker question for which we want an exact number. We will only be using this if to break a tie, so it won't count for your normal tally, but the, give, again, give us the exact number. How many bat species can be found in California? Write down the exact number for me, please. And we're going to move quickly into answers. Scoring yourself. The name of the California condor chick that was shown on the Ventana Wildlife Society cam that threatened by the 2020 Dolan fire was Inico. Inico. I wanted to just say, hey, oh, come on. <laughs> Go back. I just wanted to say, hello, my name is Inuko Montoya. You killed my father, but a better to die. Okay, move on. Uh, <laughs> known as Sets. Polyandry. Male raises the chicks after they hatch. The female goes on and finds another, another guy to hang out with. Next one is the Sykes Act. Sykes Act. And California classification in the 1960s, quote, fully protected. And our last question answer, species of lizards releasing their tail is caudal autotomy. Caudal autotomy. I recognize that those were difficult questions, but I would then like to ask people to go into chat. If any of you got six questions right, please put your answer into chat. And we're going to give you a couple seconds to type in that answer. I'm just gonna throw in two shameless promos that we are doing a student quiz bowl at the Reno meeting in early February of the Western section of the Wildlife Society. We have Cal Poly San Luis Obispo among others planning to compete. 
No one is absolutely committed in blood to compete yet, but we hope Cal Poly San Luis Obispo will be there and we hope Cal Poly kicks some humble tail. And I'm a Humboldter too, so I'm kind of partial. Did anyone get six questions right? Nope, so far nobody has anyone gotten got, If anyone got right. five questions right, please brag about it in the chat. We will also be doing an all participant trivia contest in Reno. We were trying to work out a way to surprise everyone with it, or maybe I should say uh, blindside people with it, but that <laughs> failed. But we were just going to say, oh, suddenly, hey, everyone's a trivia competitor now. Did anyone get four questions right? I think oh, about let's, three. Yeah. So if I get the two questions correct that I wrote, <laughs> do I get a prize? I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not how sure means, that's how it works. I'm not sure. That's not how that works. Dang it. <laughs> I, I I told I told Steph that these were some difficult questions. You weren't wrong, apparently. <laughs> I overestimated. Did anyone get four questions correct? How many people are still in the room? There's still 50 people out there. Yeah, if anybody got any questions correct, specifically got, more than one or two. If anyone got <laughs> go three correct, let us know. Yeah. And also let us know if you're a student because we do have the ability to give books to students. And other than Jamie, who got two correct? All you gotta do is type your name in the chat and you can win a gift certificate. Or I just got a direct message from Kim. Kim got two answers right. Kim, I believe is our winner. Okay. Oh, that's great. Great job, Kim. Yeah, I would like to find our first student winner too. Highest scoring student. Kim, make sure you share your email. Did, are there any students out there? And did any of them get two questions correct? Oh, John, don't admit to that. John says he wrote autonomy. Just blame that on web, just blame that on autocorrect. John, I made the same mistake, so I think we could give it to you. <laughs> <coughs> Correct was trying to change it to autonomy anyway. I had to look that one up myself. So is any, are there any students, John or Kim, if you're students, let us know. But I also want to know if we have any students who got two questions correct. There's also the tiebreaker question. If anyone right. knew that there were 25 species of bat in California, go ahead and add it to your total. <laughs> sure, why not? I didn't know that. Uh, didn't but if you said question. 24. Okay, so maybe we don't have any student prizes this time around. All right. Well, okay. students, Kim if just any... messaged me and said that she got three correct. She knew that one. So congratulations, Kim. You're Good. a winner. Good. Hi. Congratulations, Kim. That's excellent. Um, I'm happy to turn this back over to Jackie, I guess. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Reese. I think next year we'll uh, we'll try some easier questions. Thank you, everybody, for staying on and hanging with us. If you are around any of the breweries, please come see us, and we're going to hang out for a bit at five o'clock. And we're we'll, we're looking forward to seeing you. And thank you again for participating. Please renew your membership and join our chapter, and stay tuned for all the great things coming next year. Thank you.
I also want to say real quick thank you to the board for throwing this together. You all did an amazing job. Late nights and lots of communication between all of you over Zoom, which is fantastic. And um, really looking forward to working with you all next year too. And thank you, Jackie, for <laughs> leading everything. You know, did a great job. Thanks. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. All right. Well, I have to get ready for my son's birthday party tonight. So I am going to check out and I will be at Barrel House tonight. So if anybody's in the Paso area, I will see you there. That sounds great. Uh, I wish I could have a beer with you all, but I hope you have a nice <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be up in Monterey. So come meet your Northern yep. board representative up there. <laughs> yep. And, and, and I'll be at Bang the Drum Brewery in San Luis and Steph will just You'll I'll be, be there in New Mexico. Have <laughs> <laughs> <And> beer. <laughs> yeah, I'll have I'll have a beer here and think of you all fondly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I got Kim's information. Uh, John, send me your email address um, or a phone number or something, and I can get you your prize. All right, I'm gonna head out. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. See y'all later.